Good evening. We are live, live. <laughs> uh, Checking the chat uh, to make sure we have sound now. Um, uh, if someone would give me a thumbs up and let me know you can hear us now, that would be great. Hello. Good evening. Can you hear me? <laughs> um, so, uh, sorry for the the wait and the no sound. Um, uh, screen was showing y'all talking, but no sound. Can anyone hear me? Yes, it's working now. Cupcake Puppy says, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. The screen hey, Cupcake was... Puppy. <laughs> Good evening. All right. Okay. There we go. All right. So there's a little bit of a delay. Okay. Um, that's all right. Uh, so what we were trying to do <laughs> was to uh, play music uh, while we got set up uh, for like a half hour uh, so we could like just talk in the chat and, and whatnot and talk amongst ourselves behind the 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 wall of, of sound so we could all kind of get in, you know, just just to get ready for the time together. And um, that way, that's the plan for future live streams. So like would be to start at, let's say we started at seven, uh, there'd be music for a half hour, worship music for a half hour, and then we'd start at 7.30 and then do the, do the program. That way, if you wanted to listen to the music and we can chat in the chat while we get ready, and make sure everybody that uh, was going to be on the panel is there. That's kind of the idea. So welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome, Nori. Welcome, Cupcake Puppy. Welcome, Scripture Unbroken. Welcome, Romans, uh, or Romans Ronald Guy, and Brother Luke, and Celine. Uh, hopefully you'll be back in. And mine, Ben, haven't seen you in forever. Uh, glad to see you. And yeah, <clears throat> so uh, tonight we have on the panel uh, Ben and Angel again. Uh, hopefully they will be able to be here uh, for every show, and that's the plan. Uh, and maybe we'll have uh, a former regular panel member on tonight, maybe. Uh, that would be Mark K. Stover. Uh, so we'll see if he's able to join or not. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, how is everyone doing tonight? Uh, if you just let us know how you're doing, what's going on, that'd be great in the chat. Um, again, we are continuing the series on belief. What is it uh, biblically? Um, and also covering topics like uh, the biblical order of salvation. Where does faith fit in uh, with salvation? When when do you believe and, and how does it, that work? Is it you that does that? Is it God that does that? Those are questions that we will be attempting to answer biblically as well as just biblically defining faith. I think we did some of that last week, um, but I'm sure that will come up as we continue on. So as per usual, uh, if you have any prayer requests, uh, please put them in the chat. Um, and uh, let us let us know what we can pray for you. Um, uh, and also, if you check the description box of my previous videos, um, previous live streams, except for last week, I haven't put it in the description box last week, but nearly every other video and live stream I've done has uh, my contact information so you can send me prayer requests if you want them to be private um, or just to be prayed for uh, on, an, on the next broadcast. I can't remember everything everybody has asked me to pray for. So if I forget something while I'm praying and you've sent it, I'm sorry. Just know I have put it in God's hands um, and ask God to answer your prayer as he sees fit to do so and believe those things in the name of Jesus, that they will happen. <clears throat> so um, uh, let's go ahead and introduce the panel. Um, myself is Steve, um, and uh, 
I am a soldier for Christ, and we are indeed at war. And that is the reason for the channel name. We are at war spiritually. Um, you know, it certainly seems like we are living in the end times and uh, that the devil is becoming more and more desperate to deceive the world, to deceive those that are not in Christ, to keep them from coming to Christ, and to uh, deceive the church into not walking properly and to uh, uh, to uh, come in and spy out our liberty and keep us uh, to bring us back under bondage, under the law, to keep us from proclaiming liberty to the captives, and life to uh, to those that are that are spiritually dead, and that would be the gospel. So go ahead, uh, Angel or Ben, whoever wants to go first, introducing yourself. All right, I'll combine mine with a prayer request. So uh, my, I am I am Angel. <laughs> Guys are probably familiar with me, um, and um, so before I forget, I just want to say if you guys could um, uh, say a prayer for Victoria. Um, she is, you know, a beloved member of uh, the congregation, and she's going through quite a bit right now um, uh, in her personal life. And um, also, I heard that she needs a miracle. So I would hope everybody would just say a prayer for her. Uh, she's just an incredible uh, part of our fellowship, and we all love her dearly. Um, and also, um, if uh, if you would abide, could you guys say a prayer for my cat? Uh, my cat has a persistent situation. Like he's, well, I have a, he's quite a few cats, but uh, my my one cat, Teddy Bear, he's got uh, some kind of skin condition that can't figure out. It looks like he's just got this uh, open sore on his head, and uh, uh, he's quite overweight and everything. So trying to trying to figure out what kind of medication will help him. But um, if you guys could just say a prayer for that, because I just feel so bad for him, and it just seems to keep spreading and no matter what we try it's not working so i, I would really appreciate it and uh that, that that'll do it for me i can't wait to get started hope hope cased over uh, mark joins us it's been a while since i've talked to him so that would be great if you're out there that's a that's, that's me saying please come on <laughs> it would be really cool to see you uh see you on again Okay, and uh, do you have a channel, and how would someone find your oh, channel? Oh, yes, sorry, I forget about that. Yes, um, my, my channel is uh, just uh, Angel Martin, um, probably the only one that, I don't know, there might be a lot of Hispanic males that have that name, too, with a channel. <laughs> I thought it's always, uh, my name seems pretty uncommon until you consider the Hispanic world. They, there's a lot of Angel Mar Angel Martins out there, but uh, I think I think mine will probably be the first one that comes up, but... Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm not in the chat because I'm on my phone and it's just very hard to go back and forth. So, but, yep, that's my channel. And I try, I try to uh, do a mix of um, contending for the faith, explaining things that uh, a lot of people get wrong in terms of what the gospel is, primarily eternal security. But I also like to do a lot of videos that will draw people in that would not otherwise be watching uh videos about um, Christianity or the gospel. And so it's kind of like a little trap that I've set. And I have so far managed to get about a thousand people uh, watching my stuff. So that's not too bad, but that's why you'll see a lot of stuff on there that's kind of secular. Uh, it's kind of by design because uh, most of my viewers actually join for that reason. And then bam, I hit them with something about eternal security. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's it, I, that way I'm not just uh, in an echo chamber. You know what I mean? That's how, how to try to reach people that might not have even considered the gospel before. Um, but at least that's the way when they do, uh, they will come at it from a, a perspective that you don't otherwise get on YouTube, uh, eternal security. People that believe in eternal security are like an endangered species on YouTube, if you haven't noticed, so. But uh, yep, that should do it for me. Amen. <laughs> yes, hello everyone. Uh, sorry, I'm a little frazzled just because of all the uh, technical frustrations behind the scenes uh, get leading up to the program, but um, I'm relaxing now and look forward to this program very much. I have a channel, but I just have playlists at this point. I haven't really produced any content yet. Um, I'm kind of a, somewhat of a perfectionist, and so I don't like to put out co content until I feel it's something that's you know novel and it hasn't been Which done is before. never. 
Well, well, <laughs> just yeah, yeah. never. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. I, again, uh, I, I like to put out stuff not for the sake of putting out content. Uh, I, I want to put put out something that you know that uh, that's new or something you can't find somewhere else. Otherwise, why, why even produce it? So, um, I again, I'm just I, with uh, you. I, I no, want I you to make videos because you have some really great stuff that would be great in a little clip for people and just in one place. Yeah, in, in I, like, I, I could. I could like, you know, I have a lot of, I mean, you see my notebook, I've got a, a, a number, probably 25, 30, 40, 50 topics I could uh, definitely go into, but there's but like, you're always doing other shows too. Right. Right. Um, and my job is also pretty demanding as well. It's just, everything is like, it's, I don't, I don't do manual labor. It's all um, uh, mental. And so it's extremely exhausting in pretty much everything I do. I have to be creative at work. I have to be creative for this. So it is a challenging and, but I am not giving up. I'm, I'm constantly uh, working towards uh, my goal of pushing out content. I think you'll find when I do push out content, it'll be pretty uh, rapid fire because I've got so many things in the works nearly done. And, um, and so, yeah, that's the thing too. I probably want to start previewing some of it with uh, on, on the different programs that I'm on, but, I'm just happy to be part of uh, producing it and just being part of of this church. And um, it's so good to be with you guys once again tonight. Hello. Sorry, it's not back inside. I there know. we are. It's <laughs> loud. <laughs> Alrighty. So, uh... Here we go. Uh, okay. Um, we next thing would be to pray, and uh, if you guys would like to pray, and then I'll pray, and we'll start. Sorry, I'm, I've had to take my earbud out for a second. So okay, I'm not sure if you said anything relevant to. Oh, you, but. yes. <laughs> I, I was saying uh, uh, if either of you would like to open in prayer uh, and then I will pray and then we'll start the show. I think I'll let you go ahead and take that, take, take that, take that over. I'm okay. Terrible at that. I don't like your name. So no, you're not. <laughs> one of these days you're going to do it. <laughs> okay. One of these days I will. I will. The last time. Last time you put me on the spot with the gospel message, I totally left out. I think the resurrection. I'm not good on the spot, so so um uh, yeah. I, but I, I we got okay. to late start anyway, so we'll, we'll I let think you it was in there me. somewhere. Uh, I'm certain <laughs> we covered the resurrection for we sure at the beginning. Uh, yeah, no, I just I have never done it on the spot. I've never uh, That's I've all never, right. had, let, never timed out for me to do it. So I, <laughs> I totally here, here's the here's the thing with part of the reason that why I encourage this and ask you guys to do it, uh, whether it's the gospel on the spot or praying on the spot, is just to learn by doing yes. and to understand that. It, there, the, the only thing wrong you can do with pre preaching the gospel is to preach works included. Right. The well, only yeah. thing wrong you can do with prayer is do it phony. Right. For right. for for re or for reason by of being seen. Oh yeah. If your reason to to pray is so that people can be edified by the prayer and to pray together corporately um, and for people to learn <clears throat> that there is no specific way you absolutely have to pray, um, that there's a guideline, sure, in Scripture um, where Jesus t tells us uh, a format, but if we don't follow it, like we can get into legalism with that. If we don't oh, yeah. dot every I and cross every T that he told us, but no, it's, it's relationship. It's about talking to someone, you know, just like you would talk to me or anybody else, you know, but you're going to God. You're just right. talking. That's all you're asking him for things, thanking him for things. And that's basically it, you know? Um, so uh, well, it doesn't have to be. Excuse. <laughs> it doesn't have to be like uh, specially worded or whatever. Just let it be from the heart. That's what yeah. matters. Yeah, my, my excuse, and actually it's a good excuse, and I actually do mean it, um, is uh, a lot of times I, the Bible verses are talking about um, your joy being inexpressible 
or that we don't even know what we should pray for, but our groanings, um, uh, things like that are, are understood by God, even if we're not able to articulate them. And, um, and so sometimes that's, that's uh, why the my, Holy Spirit prays with moanings and groanings yes, that cannot yes. be uttered. Right. So, you know, that's, that's, that's yeah. an encouragement that that the Holy Spirit prays and God knows what we want, what we ask before we ask it. So it's, you know, even things we don't understand to ask for God knows. The point is just talking to him and asking. Um, I did do uh, a, a, a live stream on prayer a while back. Um, and if you watch my, my live streams from before, uh, I'm pretty sure there's one that, that in the title it talks about prayer uh, that, that we did. That would be a great one to go back and watch if you want to learn more about pray about prayer and biblically based prayer and and how we ought to pray so but that being said if you it, it's okay i'm just encouraging i can i can go ahead and i could say i can go ahead and say a prayer for victoria and then you sure. can take over whatever that. you want to pray for is uh, that's on your mind if god brings it to your attention in your mind to pray that's what i pray that's what I would recommend to do is just pray what God puts on your heart as you're thinking about things in, in prayer. You know, I'd say the most important things are, are who you're talking to and in the name of Jesus and amen. <laughs> you know, amen. so that's like, that's it. What's on your heart today with God? Oh. Right. It's just the words to, to, to the mouth part. That's the <laughs> I'm really bad about that on the spot when it comes to anything. And I start rambling. And so it, okay. it, I talk to God very casually. That's and okay. The, you know, but That's it's okay. when trying to make it worth listening to for anyone else is always the pressure. But um, but I do want to ask for that you would just lift up Victoria. Um, you know, life doesn't always go the way that we plan. And um I know that she, if she, if she had her uh, preference, she would not be in the situation that she's in. But uh, you know, some things are out of our hands. Some things are unavoidable, and um, you know, she, she really, uh, it, she's looking at some, some major life changes potentially. And Lord, I just pray that you would protect her. I pray that you would uh, preserve her through this situation. Um, that you would absolutely deliver that miracle that she needs. Uh, I, I believe that you're you're already you're already working towards that end as we speak. But um, Victoria has been a very uh, a, a wonderful blessing to uh, really the Grace community on YouTube, um, even even before and beyond our fellowship. And uh, uh, she's always wise and kind and mature. Um, in the chat, um, she has uh, opened my eyes about things that I, I thought I disagreed with uh, just just through her maturity and her grace, um, you know, causing me to look again at, you know, different doctrines and um, uh, viewpoints uh, about uh, different things in scripture. Um, and so I greatly appreciate her. And I uh, I just hope that that, you know, when this is over for her that uh, she will be able to look back and see how you uh, just uh, miraculously delivered her through it with uh, with minimal uh, pain and heartache, um, you know, as can be avoided in a situation like this, uh, which is which is always tough. But um, we love you, Lord, and we thank you so much for preserving the fellowship through the tumult that we have recently experienced. And um, uh, just uh, I just hope everybody that's out there uh, continues to give us, give us an ear, give us a chance um, as we uh, as we smooth out the kinks that are remaining. But I think I think that we are all very grateful that you have uh, have stirred things up uh, in a necessary way so that we could uh, really start start afresh um, and uh, with with no confusion, um, doing more more good than harm uh, to the body uh, who is, entrusts us and, and listens to us every week. So. Uh, thank you, Lord, and I will let uh, Steve take it over from here. Steve. 
Well, well, we're waiting for Steve. I just want to back you up, Angel. That was an awesome prayer. Mm -hmm. And I do know uh, fr from this biblical precedent that God uh, often delivers a miracle when uh, all when it seems like it's all hope is lost. Um, when it's at the very end, Absolutely. when it seems impossible, this the situation is dire. That's when He steps in and delivers a miracle. So, um, yeah, that was a wonderful prayer, Angel, and I, I'm 100% um, echo that. <laughs> oh, thank you, Ben. Well, he he did that in you by bringing you on to the to the panel um, just in the nick of time. I believe uh, God Himself uh, staged a coup, uh, as they say, uh, in order to mm. uh, in order to get this ship on the right path. Um, and uh, and I'm you and Steve are really. Uh, are really the the guys that were at, at the wheel in a way. Um, it was just amazing how God works and how God uh, brings everything in its own time. So um, yeah, and lest, and lest anyone take huh? your words out of context and, no. and try to beat them, uh, that was not uh, intentional or my desire. Um, that was happened. my point: is that God, yeah. God yes. was at the helm, and there's a they lot know. of talk about coups, but if it was yeah. a coup, it was God's coup. Uh, yeah. I truly believe that nothing it couldn't have timed out the way that it did um, with no with no planning on our own parts. Uh, you know, I, I totally believe this was God's God's will with uh, with the fellowship. So, hey, Steve. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I was I was muted and asking. I don't know if uh, I was I was going to go and uh, ask. I don't know if I <laughs> wanted to pray or not. Um, so. Uh, and I was going to be like, okay, I'll go. And mm -hmm. if Ben wants to go, I'm going to pray. Okay. So if you want to say something, uh, but uh, okay. Oh, you didn't Thank hear you. Yeah, Ben added in. Yeah, <laughs> go on. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for all of the many blessings we have in Christ. Uh, we have so many. Uh, the things we're often, we often don't think about on a daily basis and that we ought to, that we ought to think about and remind ourselves of just even, even the simple blessing that we have of being washed in the blood of the lamb, that we are perfect. Even though we don't see that perfection in our daily lives, we are perfect. We have been made righteous by, by the offering of your son and our faith in that offering and in his resurrection, we have been made perfect and therefore able to uh, uh, go to heaven and spend the rest of eternity with you. Um, and so we thank you for, for that alone. Uh, and then uh, the just just being able to be to tap into the spirit, to your spirit that gives life and peace and joy and, and helps us to be kind and loving and patient and uh, go through those fiery trials that uh, James tell us to consider pure joy, uh, that, that we go through these things. Um, has been said that, you know, it's, it's often the uh, darkest, you know, that, the, the phrase it's darkest before the dawn. I, I, I'm sure there's a scripture that pertains to that, um, that God often lead just like Psalms 23. Yea, the, uh, I shall fear no evil. You know, that even though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for I know you're with me. Even when I can't understand it, I know it. And sometimes the most beautiful thing is to have gone through those things, God, and to be able to look back and see your hand at work in those darkest times that, that we thought would crush us, that we thought would wreck our faith, that we thought we couldn't make it through, but somehow, some way we made it through to the other side and can look back and now know that you never left us. And indeed, you never would leave us. You would never forsake us, even though we might have forsook ourselves in the process that you never left. You, you never stopped speaking, even when we didn't want to listen. So uh, I thank you that you are such an awesome God, that you are faithful, that you are beyond uh, what we understand as faithfulness. 
that you define faithfulness. We do not. We don't even understand the depth of the faithfulness that you are um, and, and your love for us. That it's incomprehensible to to us to fully understand it in our in our mortal state when we see face to face now we see through a glass darkly but when we see face to face we shall know these things and that is something to be grateful for just ahead of time and i personally thank you for for uh for the most amazing thing for me today to be grateful for besides your son dying on a cross for me and and rising again to give to give me eternal life is to thank you for nine years uh, of marriage with my wife and uh, I, and I am so grateful for a a loving partner a loving woman to be by my side through thick and thin to to be an example of to me of the unconditional love of Christ that when I've been at some of the worst points in my walk with her and uh, to look back and see her continuing to love me uh, even through all that uh, I can see you in her because of that and I just praise you for that and I, I pray for 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 needs that are unspoken I pray for those that that uh, have things in their life they don't know who to turn to, to who to talk to, who to trust with, but I know that they can talk to you, that you are trustworthy. When everyone else is not trustworthy, you are trustworthy. And I pray that they would take those things to you, God, in prayer and, and stand on the word of God for things that you have promised us, things like that, that we ask for about, about you saving our loved ones, um, that, you know, we, that that when we preach the gospel, that their ears would be open because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, that, that we bind and rebuke uh, the, the enemy's attacks because he seeks to, to kill and destroy uh, ourselves. He k- seeks to kill and destroy our loved ones, and we come against those things in the name of Jesus. Um, I, I pray for all those that have struggles with uh, mental uh, mental issues like depression and anxiety and and all those sorts of things that that you would heal them, whether it's through your mighty hand and in a mighty act of deliverance and miracle or through help from a doctor and counseling that you would help them find peace in their mind. We ask you for that in the name of Jesus. And most of all, I ask you tonight to bless this time together that the words that we speak would not be ours, would be your words, that they would be spirit and life to the hearer, and that that you would open the ears and eyes of those watching and listening, that when they hear the gospel, they would hear it and believe it, as as your word declares they, they can. And uh, we thank you and rebuke any attack from the enemy, from the devil, against this stream. In the name of Jesus. I pray and thank you, and let it be so in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, Ben, uh, five-minute gospel. Go. Yes or no? (laughs) Go. Okay, uh, I'm not good on the spot either. Um, (laughs) That's okay. I'll do my best. Um, I'm kind of scattered brain. I think you guys know I'm scatterbrained. Um, so I like to take it back to the Garden of Eden. Um, not always, but uh, for for I, I think one thing about when we preach the gospel that's uh, often overlooked, um, not by anyone here particularly, but just in Christendom in particular, is the identification truths. So our our, our new identity in Christ and understanding that can really help dispel so much false doctrine. And so I like to. Um, I like to emphasize that. And so, um, as we know, back in the garden, uh, that's where the original sin occurred, uh, uh, for man at least, uh, where uh, 
Eve partook uh, of something that that was uh, it was off limits essentially. God said it was not for you. You're not supposed to uh, partake of it. Yet she did, and when she did, um, you know, one thing in, in Genesis that's emphasized over and over again in Genesis is all things give uh, beget begat after its own kind. So uh, you know, a tree begets a tree. Uh, uh, you know, a, a certain kind of tree begets a certain kind of fruit. Um, a certain kind of animal begets a, a certain kind of animal. And if we apply that to the uh, to the uh, to the fall, it's uh, Adam and Eve were, were uh, created innocent. They weren't created righteous. If they were righteous, they never would have sinned. But they had one law essentially that they couldn't uh, violate. And so when they violated that, they became uh, sinners. And because they were sinners, again f- applying the principle of beginning after its own kind. Everyone after Adam and Eve that they begat uh, we became sinners, and so we sin not because um, we're sinners, not because we sin, but we are are um, we sin because we're sinners. It's our very character to do that, uh, and so I, I don't think that's a mystery to anyone. And so uh, that's so our first birth is uh, corrupt. There's no there's no reforming it. There's no trying to correct our flesh. Um, our flesh is, is corrupt. In fact, the Bible says that our flesh grows corrupt over time. Um, and so that's why we need to be born again. Um, and if you think about it, um, Adam and Eve, uh, when they first procreated, it was, um, you know, the, the act of procreation is a form of lust, if you will. So we were born in lust or through lust of the flesh. And that's why we need to be born again through sacrifice. And that's what Christ uh, uh, did for us. He he uh, took on human flesh. He was he was the God man, fully God, fully man, and he stood in in history and came into our reality and lived a perfect life. He was our as our perfect substitute. So everything that people would uh, say to you that you must do, you must ask yourself: Well, did Christ do that? So, for example, uh, why was Christ water baptized? Well, he said to John, so that all righteousness could be fulfilled. So if someone were to say to you, for example, that you need to be water baptized, you could always point to Christ and say, well, he was water baptized. If someone says to you, well, you must not add or take from God's word. uh, Well, did Christ ever do that? No, he spoke on his father's authority. He spoke the words that that the father gave him. So if you were to do that, again, uh, Christ did not do that. And he served as our perfect substitute so that he could die as a man. for, and, and he so he lived a perfect sinless life. He was a, he was without sin, and, and we are sinners. And so he was uh, tried. Uh, he he kept all the righteous requirements that the law demanded. God poured His wrath on him. So every every righteous demand, every every law, every violate every penalty for the violation of that law was laid on Christ. He wore our sin, and he died. Uh, and he rose again. And by raising again, God says he was raised, or Paul says he was raised for our justification. So if Christ is raised and we believe that, God puts us in him. So that we are, Christ basically filled our, our, our uh, took our spot in the in the rotten family tree of, of Adam. Adam was a rotten, he was a, if you think of mankind as a tree, um, the first man, that was a rotten tree. And everything that that begot, that that, that tree begat, it was rotten. Uh, and that's why, again, we need to be born again in Christ's perfect tree. He's the root. He's the root of that new tree. And we become essentially a branch or a, a leaf in this tree, if you will, when we when we believe on what he did. Uh, and so, again, he was raised for our justification so that we could be born again in his family tree. It matters. Not, the rest of what you believe, uh, again, he died for all sin, period. Every sin that was ever Every every sin you could contemplate, uh, every sin that was done it uh, that was done by man in the past, every sin that was done it done in the present, and every future sin he paid for it. So if you believe in him again, he plugs your hole essentially in that rotten family tree, and he puts you in his new family tree, born again. Uh, you cannot sin. He's already seated us. That new man cannot sin. He's already seated us in heavenly places. So you're already in heaven. You're no longer associated with the world. The world has been crucified to you. And the the world the uh, the world to crucify to you, and you crucify to the world. So any verses you see, for example, that talk about the world uh, and the condemnation that's coming upon it, you're not associated with that world anymore. 
And so there's nothing that you can do. There's nothing that uh, any, you could do or uh, anyone could do to you that would make you lose that salvation. God see, already sees your first birth is already dead. So it's like, it's like, um, you know, someone to say, oh, well, geez, you better not do this. Well, that's like saying, uh, you're pulling, you're digging up an old corpse and, uh, trying to make it to animate it or give it life and make it and, and associate sin with it when it's already dead. So again, we died our first birth. We already died with Christ. We're dead to the law where there's no law. There's no offense. And so there's, there, Paul said, uh, where's boasting by what law? And he says that that's like a rhetorical question. There's no law that can condemn us. And we are, the only law that we're under is the law of faith. And the law of faith says, whoever believes in, in the finished work of Christ has eternal life. Um, so I will, um, I will, uh, <laughs> yeah, as you can see, uh, uh, the only thing I, I'm not, I'm not a great gospel presenter, but at least I, like you said, Steve, I didn't preach a false gospel. So I hope it's that an art hard. to try to condense it all into one yes. like small yes. presentation when you haven't done it before. Right. <laughs> okay. I would yeah, that, no, I thought that was very good though. Uh, I, you didn't, I did uh, as well. Yeah. Okay. I, I, especially for never having done it before. It's uh, it's tough because I'm so focused on works and not, and not, uh, not That's preaching right. works for salvation that it's so it's easy to get caught up on that and not uh, and not preach the fullness of, of, of the gospel but so i thought you did a great job okay. you covered all the bases that that's okay and i think that's the that that's important to 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 illustrate um that uh, to illustrate it this way the the scripture was authored by the holy spirit and penned by man so it's exactly what God wanted said in the language of the writers. It's perfect, but yet worded by man. Do you understand? So when you yeah. preach the gospel and it's accurate in truth and you're preaching it out of your language that you understand and you're saying it in a way that, that is biblical, but yet is also relevant and revelatory to the person you are preaching it to. You are doing what the scripture tells us to do. What Paul said to do is, is that I become all to all that I might reach some. So when you're preaching to, you know, uh, you know, uh, an intellectual crowd, you would try to talk intellectual. If you're preaching to the common man, you would preach to, to those particular people. But God also often calls us to places and people that we have been, that we have been, uh, uh, ha that, we, that God has called us out of, he calls us to go back to. So if God has called you out of a works-based ideology and you understand the truth, God would call you back to that, to preach the truth to them. If you were called out of a strip club, God might call you to go back to a strip club or et cetera, or a whorehouse or crack house or whatever, not to sin but to go preach the gospel. Jesus went and hang, hung out with sinners where the sinners were at. There's nothing wrong with calling believers and the sinner to come to a place to worship God and to hear the truth. But if that's all we do, that's biblically uh, inaccurate. So to go to people and meet them where they are, like Jesus did, and, and loved them and gave them the truth where they were not judging them, but ministering to them as a doctor, you know, ministers to patients. It used to be back in the old days, you would call the doctor, the doctor would come to you. Now we have it backwards where you go to the hospital or go to the doctor's office. Back in the old days, before the internet and, and all that, uh, you would actually send someone to go fetch a doctor, and they would come to you. 
Well, I believe the same is true with the gospel and people that are dying and lost. <clears throat> they may be seeking an answer, and also God is seeking all, which we'll get into eventually here in this series, um, but that, uh, that God sends us to them to preach the gospel, to tell the gospel. So it's important that we know our audience and we, we, we preach the gospel in, in the language of the people. And that's often the language that we are ourselves understand it and can word it best. And, uh, I believe that God leads us to speak things as, as he wants us to say them. Uh, you know, you can't go wrong with, first Corinthians one through four, but like you guys said, you want to include a more full, uh, depth understanding. But if you only have five minutes, you know, hit, hit the very basics at the very least, like, you know, uh, and I'm not saying you guys did wrong at all. No, because we have the time here, but this is partly also an exercise and why I throw it to you is, um, is, is to, is to practice it so that if you're asked or God leads you to talk to a person, if you're in the store or if you're, you know, at, you know, at the bowling alley or wherever, and someone asks you, or you feel led to tell someone, you know, that, that you have, that it's practiced in, amongst the safety of the brethren. So first Corinthians 15, one through four, uh, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand by which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory, what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. So that's the simple gospel. That's like the outline of the gospel, of what Christ accomplished. And we can go through each point, addressing those three points, that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and then rose again. The two obviously key points are, are that he died for our sins and rose again. The burial part is important for sure, because it pertains to prophecy and what God said he would do. But obviously the dying for our sins, that's very important. And you can spend days on that. You can spend days on, on the resurrection. Um, and you, the best thing to do is to use the time you have to preach as much of the wholeness of the gospel you can in the time you're, you, you, that you're allowed. If you have five minutes, do the five minute presentation. If you have 25 minutes, do a 25 minute presentation. You know, I would suggest starting off with the basics. Jesus died for your sins, was buried and rose again. Now, what does that mean? And then you then go through that. That's how, at least personally, I would do it. And, and uh, you know, one of the most simple ways for me is that <clears throat> you can't do anything to earn it but believe, and you can't do anything to unearn it, to lose it. You can't lose it once you have it because then it wouldn't be eternal. And I think that's important to, to cover as well. So... The work thing, uh, that's very important, especially in today's day and age where everything we think about in life, you know, you hear phrases like uh, nothing in life is free. You know, if you want something bad enough, you got to go out and get it. You know, uh, 80% of success is, is uh, trying, is working for it. 20% ingenuity. If that, but that's in life. That's in, that's in the doing of life. That's not in salvation and, and Christianity being a Christian, being one who is in Christ, being a believer, being, being, uh, how they were originally described a follower of Christ, a follower of the way. Um, 
being saved has absolutely has absolutely nothing to do with works and it's the only faith that does not determine eternal life based on how good or bad you are in your actions in your walk it it's the only faith that says if you believe you are you are now made perfect so that you can receive eternal life now <clears throat> let me walk with you and i'll show you the eternal salvation in your life temporally as you walk with me you'll see victory in your life liberty in your life as you allow my grace to teach you which is the walk part so uh you know the, all of these things are important and don't get discouraged on did i word it right did i say the right things as long as you cover that you're you know without faith you're a sinner doomed to hell whatever that be it's horrible don't go there get fire insurance <laughs> by believing in jesus who died for those sins gives you perfection in exchange for your faith and because he rose again as as proof of the guarantee that you will rise again as well <laughs> and obviously there's a lot more to that but uh you know that's we can we could talk about those things too uh the fact that that if Christ, you know, wasn't risen, uh, then then our faith is in vain, our preaching is in vain, and you won't be resurrected either if Jesus didn't rise again from the dead, because uh, then then we would have no no guarantee that God can raise the dead unto eternal life, because He is God, because Jesus is God. That's part of the gospel that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is God that he was manifested in the flesh, fully God, fully human. That's why he's a kinsman redeemer, because he was 100% man and was 100% tempted yet didn't sin. So all of these things are important points in preaching the gospel, but at least preach the basics. And I think you guys did that. I think you guys did excellent. Um, and you did it from your own unique uh, understanding of what you see in scripture that's important to, to the, to what Jesus did in the gospel, in the salvation he acquired and procured on our behalf. So don't think yep. you did it wrong. That's actually good that you say that. Cause like that was for me, anytime, anytime I'm usually given the gospel, I'm, I'm speaking to people that uh, either I know or presume are kind of coming from a place that I came from where, you know, as an unbeliever completely, like, uh, I understood the correct gospel. I understood, like, what it was uh, my whole life, but I didn't understand why it made sense, why why it was necessary. Like, I didn't, it just seemed so arbitrary. Like, wait, so what? Like, what? all of it, I did, like, why do you have to die? Like, what? why is there, why is there sin? Like, what? I don't understand. Like, why would him dying do anything for me? And so when I write, you know, preach the gospel, I try to explain it in a way people like that can understand. Um, uh, and I'm not, I'm not as good at, uh, at, you know, uh, preaching it from the perspective of somebody that was raised in false doctrine, you know? Um, uh, I mean, I do, uh, I understand, like, I, I really try to hammer home, home the idea of, of why we don't work for it, because that's something I think even somebody that was, came from a, like an atheist perspective struggles to understand. Um, but, um, but I always, I always try to explain it in terms that are, uh, almost like not Christianese because I know for me when I was when I was lost uh, you like a lot of the biblical terminology and explanation of it uh, didn't didn't get past my uh, my armor didn't get past my mental wall I had to hear it from an entirely different like perspective but it was it was still accurate but somebody had to kind of explain it to me in a legal in a legal framework because I could understand that and I understood how he was a precedent. You know, that Adam set the first president and Christ, Christ, you know, undid that precedent then to actually, you know, superseded it and, and, and set a new precedent for us. Um, so I think what you said is really, really, uh, it's a really good point about how God calls us to kind of go back to where we came from. Um, 
I think that's where he uses us most effectively. I think that's, you know, that's one of the things that's so miraculous about how, how uh, he delivered me because, um, you know, I've seen many times now that people that, you know, did not understand even the point of all of it, at least get the point now. And they see how it's reasonable because uh, God showed me that. And it's usually about the same mental blocks that that come up for everybody when they're coming from an atheist worldview. So what were you going to say, Ben? I thought I heard you chiming in. Well, I, I just got to back you up. Uh, I think you're right. Uh, that's a good point. And um, like you said, like, OK, why would Christ dying? Why would it solve yeah. sin? And I think a good illustration for that, for me, at least, is is the, and then the Bible does this, teaches this to it, where. Adam and Eve became one flesh, and the then the output of that was you know a being that represented it was kind of half you know half mother half father, yes. um, or fully mother fully father, and and that's why and they were again they were married they became one flesh and when we believe on Christ he died for our sins we come become one flesh with him and one yes. spirit with him. and so it's a like you said legally uh, legally it's it's a marriage and what God joined together let no man uh, Tara Sunder, and it's a new man. It, 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 that's why you need to be born again. It, it produce it re, it re, yes. uh, results in a new man, a, a regenerated man that is not um, that has no sin. And so yes, I think but, that's helped. Maybe you could probably articulate it light years better than I could, but uh, I think that's a good angle to take um, to explain why uh, why Christ dying could could actually pay for other people's sins. Well, that's a good point I never thought of. And and, and also being born again, uh, when I try to explain to people how you, you can't earn God's love, just like a child cannot earn their parents' love. I mean, it would sound ridiculous to any of us to think of a, a, ch a parent saying that to their child that, that they bore with no, you know, the child didn't ask for it and asked to be created, right? Um, uh, and, you know, and, and we're supposed to love our child, bare minimum, we're supposed to love them. Um, but people have this misconception that we're all God's children, no matter what, even unbelievers. And that's not true. We have to be born again into his family to receive that 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 unconditional love that the world tells us. All we want in the world is unconditional love. And it's true. But they lie to us and make us make us think that, um, you know, even even when I was an atheist, I thought, well, well, you know, if there is a God, of course, he would love us unconditionally. We wouldn't have to you know, uh, believe this or that, it would just be unconditional, right? But, but you know, and they stop short because even the, the most commonly preached gospels stop short of this because they preach works. They stop short of telling us, yes, it's unconditional. It's not petty. It's not about your performance, but you have to be born again. You have to be born anew into God's family. And then, yes, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't unbecome his child at that point. That's when it's, that that is when this love is, um, is completely based in his grace and it's it's familial in that way because uh as christ was his son that's why he's another precedent he's a he's a he's a legal precedent in that way we become uh you know born anew uh as as children of god and there's no one doing that once that happens just like you can you can uh divorce from your family i guess in court uh but we all know that just because you go and you get emancipated that doesn't mean you're not your parents child there's nothing you can do to, to, to make yourself not your parent's child. That's why there's no loss of salvation. You cannot undo something like that. We all know that uh, intellectually. Uh, this is why it's so crazy that uh, people can't understand that. It's just so it's just so plain uh, to see. You can uh, you can be disinherited, I suppose. But the, the issue of uh, that that's, would be an issue of, of rewards, not an issue of salvation. In, as people don't think indeed, that. indeed, and also. Um, just to interject, sorry to interrupt. I really wanted to emphasize a point that, uh, in being born, just because we have a physical way of, of like being disinherited by, by our parents, earthly parents, uh, that a, that doesn't apply to God in his word. Also, uh, you know, that, that there's also, you know, being emancipated, uh, an emancipated minor, you know, can, you know, that, that you can change your name, etc. However, still your parents, child. the wife of the body is in the blood. Yep. You cannot change your, um, you mm -hmm. cannot change your DNA. You cannot change who you were born unto that the seed is in you. And just like Ben was saying earlier, that, that 
that you were born unto and after your kind. And the same is true in the natural that is is true in the spiritual. That once you are born of the spirit, as Jesus says in John 3, you are now born again. You have been born anew, born born into a new life, a new family. That's why we are now called the children of God. And God does not abort or, uh, you know, cancel that. And he's, he, there's so many promises uh, that you would have to negate in order to, to have somehow lost salvation. You know, you can't be snatched out of the Father's hand. You can't be snatched out of the Son's hand. Jesus said he'll lose none that believe in him. Um, at and, least 63 and promises, just, at least. Yeah, yeah. And actually, if you go to Angel Martin, uh, her channel on YouTube, and you go to her community tab, and you scroll down, you'll find that list. Of, I, of actually, I should share that again. Three promises. Make so, that into like a website is, or something so I can right. link it directly. Yeah, right. I need to talk to Ben about that because right. that's really useful. I use it, it anytime is. a Lord Shipper comes at me in comments. I pay salary. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Um, it would be, it, it, that's an awesome, that's an awesome, awesome thing. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, to, even just those three that I mentioned, if you were to say someone lost salvation, and not to mention he says it's eternal and it's given unto you and that Jesus that that it also says in his word the gifts of and callings of God are without repentance without God's repentance he doesn't he doesn't uh take it, it, there's no back there's no take backsies with God but with those 3 to 4 just 3 to 4 promises to say you could lose salvation would be calling God a liar would be calling Jesus a liar. And, and, a and a, yes, a failure, etc. But I, I think to, to put it in those terms, at least for me, really like nails down the coffin of works into the ground that, that, and this idea that you could lose salvation those three that no one can take you out of the father's hand. No one can take you out of Jesus hands that you're marked and sealed by the Holy spirit. All three of the triune God that is one. Have you in possession? The other scripture, now that I've said possession, it says you are now no longer your own. You've been bought with a price. So it's not your life anymore because you've been born again. Which when someone says that you give your life to Christ when you believe, in effect, that's true. Not in the way uh, a Lord Shipper would think of it, but in that verse's context that when you believe you've been now purchased and redeemed. You're no longer your own. And by believing, you have given your body to Christ, which is why it says, therefore, honor God with your body in your, in your walk. That's what we're supposed to do in gratitude for the salvation you've already see, received. That's why Paul says, I think in Ephesians, either Ephesians or Galatians, he says, I, I, I run this race, something to this effect, uh, to, to the effect of, I run it as if I have not attained that for which I have already attained. Is that, so in other words, he's saying, I run the race, I run my walk, as though I haven't been made perfect and I'm trying to be perfected and reach towards perfection, knowing all the while I've already received it. And that's why, let's see, that's, it's not, I guess you could say it's not completely altruistic on our part because of the fact that we can gain or lose rewards based on our performance, not, not, not salvation. Salvation is not a reward, but, um, um, 
in a way, this is this is how God frees us to to do one thing in life that people can't, uh, you know, that's not really selfish because we're we're not trying to save our own butts with how we how we perform for God. Um, we we have it. We have the this the, the the ultimate wish that anybody you know who's ever lived. Um, you know, in their heart, no matter, you know, what they might tell themselves really wishes is for eternal life is to not have to fear uh, the sting of death. And um, by by freeing us with salvation that we don't have to work for it, we don't have to work to keep it or to attain it. Um, God allows us this this uh, opportunity to serve him freely um, and not self-servingly, because I don't care what anybody says. If, if you if they think they're working for salvation itself eternal life immortality which i often say to, to you know it, when a lot of when we hear about the search for godhood or man wanting to become god it's always eternal life that they're talking about so in a way it's like it's like attaining godhood it might as well be for, to us the, you know we're, we're just mortal we have the, the lifespan of a mayfly really especially the older you get the, the more you see that or the more people you lose um the more you see that because i know um after i lost a great, a great, huge chunk of my family, um, you know, in, in my late 20s, just back to back, I realized how short our lifespan was. And I, I, it was very depressing uh, as I was lost at the time. So um, it was kind of like most people don't lose that many people that close to them until they're quite a bit older. So for me to have that understanding of mortality at such a young age was um, a very a huge burden. It was it, was, it, it, it drained all the joy out of me. Um, even the great things that uh, that I had in life, um, even my my first child, I, I did not enjoy because I saw the mortality staring me and staring her in the face. And um, uh, when God uh, erases that fear for us and uh, gives us the ultimate wish freely, uh, and then yeah, we can we have this vague idea of rewards, like that you know something that we can you know get um, in addition to salvation for serving Him. But honestly. Uh, the thing that people work most of their life for in any religious context is eternal life. And God gives us the ability to where we, we can serve him freely without that, without that uh, over our heads and, um, and to where it is something we do out of gratitude. And really we don't get an opportunity like that in any other, any other context in life. Not really. Cause even in relationships, you know, even the, um, you know, uh, good we do for others, you know, so much of the time it's, 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 uh, it's self-serving. Um, but in this way, we get to 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 actually uh, we can work we can work to to show our gratitude or or we can you know we can be uh, ungrateful spoiled brats. Um, but uh, you know that's the blessing of it, and I don't understand why people don't see that why they don't see how cheap it is if we're working for salvation. How cheap those works are um, compared to 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 being able to do it freely out of the goodness of our heart, out of the gratitude and the love that we have for God, who has given us this greatest of all gifts, you know, simply for believing, um, which we, you know, when no other faith, no other, no other religion promises such a thing. Um, uh, it, everything else is operant conditioning where, where uh, a reward is, is dangled in front of us in return for behavioral modification. And I do believe God made sure that that could not be said in truth of his gospel because that is one of the first claims any any atheist will, will will say is that religion is a control mechanism and i always love to point out when they say that well what a crappy control me mechanism christianity is cuz god gives the 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 ultimate prize he gives it away freely for believing whoops i guess he forgot to you know about the carrot and the stick principle you know what i mean i guess he forgot that that you know about the entire point of offering a, of offering a reward if you claim salvation is a reward because he gives it freely it's not a control mechanism. Um, well said. And uh, sorry, I'm saying. I was saying, well said. Yeah, that was a good point. Uh, I uh, I'm freezing out here. <laughs> it's getting cold here. I don't know about you, Ben, but it's getting cold and rainy. I'm outside trying to make it so it's not so noisy with my kids. Oh, Steve. Yep. Uh, oh, sorry, you're a little bit far away from your mic. I think. Ah, uh, yes. I, there I was. Uh, okay. Yes. Um, I forgot what I was going to Well, say. I think we summarized what we need to be believing. I think yeah. we, we have a list to get into about what that is, what it is to believe. What, what, how does that, how does that work? What does that entail? Yes. What does it not entail? 
And another thing with that is then is then understanding scripture in that light. So when you see things or are told things like, you know, uh, especially, if, you know, if you're looking at another version, et cetera, that might seem to suggest something that you need to look at context uh, with these things. Um, uh, you know, like Roman, uh, I saw it in the chat, somebody talking about, you know, a lordship or saying you need to be a slave to, to, to Christ now or something like that. Um, and I know that, um, in other versions, like, uh, that, that read, uh, in Roman six, that instead of servants, it says slaves. So, and that's, and that's just a, another word for the same concept of someone who is working for someone else. So if we look at the work part and it's separated from salvation, then we can understand these, these scriptures more accurately. That way they are not negating the promises of God. Because scripture also says all the promises of of God are yea and amen. They are yes and amen. They are, they are not no. If God has promised something, he will do it. He does not, uh, you know, we talked about last week how seriously God takes his word. I believe it was Friday night. Yeah, we talked Friday night on uh, Church of the Eternally Secure. If you go watch that, uh, we talked about, or at least I, I addressed, how seriously God takes his word. And that if he says something, he will do it. He takes his word extremely seriously. He's elevated his word above his name, above himself. That's how seriously he takes his word. So if he says... Uh, they that believe on me, to them I give eternal life, and I shall lose none. That's a very important thing in Scripture. So nothing else can come against that in Scripture. And if you think it does, then you're wrong. On the authority of Scripture, I tell you, you are wrong. Uh, so when, like in Romans 6, verse 16, uh, you know, that it says servants, some translations call it slave. Um, uh, most slaves, quote unquote, in the Bible are what we would call an employee today. You're working for something or working off something. Um, you're working to earn money. Uh, back then, if you were a slave, you were working to pay off a debt, but you were to be treated kindly as a member of the family Etc. We don't even see that from most of our employers. They don't treat you like family. So technically, they're not even honoring God and how he viewed uh, a, a slave to be. Um, and even in that, that's something that God also fulfilled in Christ. That he paid your debt. So you don't have to. So you don't have to work. That's why the Old Testament is a written example of the natural that pertains to the spiritual. That these things are not, that these things were done by Christ. These are shadows of what Christ did. Um, uh, I, I would agree, Mr. Rich Bob, most slaves then are better than employees today. That's, that's exactly uh, my point. Um, they were better off then as, than they are today. Um, uh, so, uh, know, know ye not, in Romans 6, 16, uh, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants or slaves to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Well, if I take that verse out of its context, which would be chapter 6, which would be the letter to to. The, the entire letter of Romans, and then in the context of the rest of Scripture. If it does not line up, if your interpretation does not line up of that verse with Jesus saying, uh, if you believe that, that, you know, in me, then you'll have, that I, that I give you eternal life, and, and I will lose none that believe, uh, then your interpretation is wrong. 
so we have to have those that greater context and the individual uh, and the context within the passage as well. What is he talking about? Is he talking about salvation? Does it say salvation? Or is it talking about life? Where what you are uh, doing to whom you obey is what you are doing. So uh, whether you are our servants to obey, uh, his servants, ye are to, who, to whom ye obey, whether of sin and a death. So sin, if you're sinning willfully, it's going to bring death into your life. Be that uh, uh, death in your health, de- death uh, of your life, uh, death in your finances, death in your relationships, death in your mind, etc. Um, uh, you know, that's why there's STDs because that's part of the consequence of sinning against what God has called us into, which would be marriage, uh, of, a, of one man to one woman, uh, for life. Uh, so when you step outside that you have consequences and one of those consequences can be, uh, STDs, um, and and so that's a sin that would be unto death that could cause you death, physical death, or of obedience unto righteousness. So when you obey God at His Word, in His Word of how we're supposed to live, you are living righteously. And this is again confirmed in Romans chapter seven and eight, where where Paul admits his own struggle of his, in his walk. Uh, but then at the end of Romans eight in the beginning of Romans eight, that there is no condemnation for them who are in Christ And at the end of Romans eight, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And he lists all kinds of things, including things that are future. So, uh, if, if that's the case and, and the, the, the continued context of Romans is that, that those of us that are in Christ are not under condemnation and that that at the end of Romans 8 that uh that we can't that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ then this cannot be about salvation what it's saying here but God be thanked that ye were that ye were the servants of sin but ye have obeyed from the heart which is uh psyche the mind will and emotion that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, which would be the gospel. You've obeyed from the heart. You believed from the heart. <laughs> Being then made free from sin, you became servants, the servants of righteousness. Being then made free from sin. Not, it doesn't say being then con, in a process of being, uh, becoming perfect. No, it doesn't, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say, uh, being then, uh, in a process of, of sanctification, being someday free from sin, hopefully. No, it's then being, being then past tense. Then when, when you obeyed from the heart, the gospel, that form of doctrine, which was delivered unto you from the heart, Being then made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. Aha! Is that then now about my walk or about what I obeyed from the heart? That's belief. Since we're talking about belief here. Yeah, I think it's... Obeying from the heart. That form of doctrine. Yeah. It, it, it's 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 both things here. It's 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 ownership. It's it's yeah. It's it's ownership. It is. It's uh. It's it's proclaiming who you are in Christ, um, and it's also proclaiming uh, prior to belief you were a servant of sin, for sure. After belief you've been made a servant of righteousness, but it's also saying in your actions of what you do is who you are a slave or servant unto. Uh, I, uh, in Romans uh, 6.19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members 
servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield, yield willful obedience, your, your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. But that's after you've already been made free from sin. In verse 18, you became servants of righteousness. Now you were this, you were because you weren't believers prior. Now you are, now you've already been made free from sin. Now walk it out. And, and Paul, you know, in verse, in, uh, chapter seven, um, uh, you know, he, he talks about his own struggle in chapter eight. He talks about the fact that we're not under condemnation, nothing can separate us. So, uh, I was, I just wanted to address that, 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 uh, qu like question or statement in the chat about what a Lord shipper said and the fact that it does pertain to belief that when you obey, you are, well, when you believe you are obeying the gospel, uh, that that was delivered unto you. That was a doctrine of truth delivered unto you that you received. Uh, so yeah, okay. Then if did you have anything else you wanted to say on that? Please do. Uh, well, um, <coughs> excuse me. Where are you at in the document exactly? I am not in the document. I I <laughs> looked up a verse uh, in Romans. Uh, so, but we can go to the document. Uh, that would be on page two. Uh, I put the link in the chat several times. I'll put it in there again. Uh, just so you know, we're on page two. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Page two. I, have, I, I have a couple things I'd like to say when we get to the seeking part, um, which looks like it might be coming up. But Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, sure. I didn't know if you wanted to say something on what I was saying about the, the slavery or slash servant thing. Um well, or yeah. Angel. Uh, well, I I basically see the slavery or the servanthood uh, being uh, to, to begin with. There's a starting premise, and that starting premise is ownership. So now that you're owned by righteousness or owned by God, now that you're dead dead to the law, dead to sin, because you were owned by it before. Essentially, you were a servant of it, but now that you're a servant of of righteousness, like you said, uh, you're owned by it, and once you're owned by it, uh, there's no there's no buying it back. And uh, and Indeed. because of that, now like you said, walk it out, and that's that's the, the that's the general principle I see all through Scripture. Whereas uh, Paul, Paul, all the apostles make this conclusion, even Jesus, where they'll they'll start off with the premise, and because that premise is true, now now go ahead, now now I want you to because this is true, now this is I want this is how you should walk or consider yourself. So, for example, um, where. You know, for example, uh, it's, it's uh, 1 John 4, 19, where he says, we love him because he first loved us. So it always starts with God. And then because of that premise, because he loved us, because he died for us, because we were born again, let's now love him. Um, another example would be um, uh, Galatians 4, 9, where it says, but now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn back to weakness, uh, weak and beggarly things? So, again, the premise is uh, it's not so much that you know God. It's that God knows you now as, in, in, in a spiritual regeneration sense. Um, and because of that, because you, because he knows you and he's bestowed on you a knowledge, uh, you know, wh why are you going back to that which you, you died to, essentially? Um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, we sacrifice for him because he first sacrificed for us. We seek him because he first sought us. And I see that the people, um, a lot of people have that backwards. They say, no, you got to seek him uh, and then he'll, he'll, he'll seek you and give you this gift faith or whatever, or uh, it, it's always backwards. And in my, in my view, I, I see through scripture, after studying the, the seeking thing, it's, it, God only asks people to seek to him uh, to people that already have a covenantal relationship with him. So under under the law, they had a covenantal relationship with, with God already, and then that's who he told to seek him. He didn't tell the world at large to seek him. Um, it was already people that had a relationship with him. And just like in Hebrews where it says he's a, uh, a rewarder to those who diligently seek him. Those are people under the covenant of grace, I believe. 
Uh, and that is why he's, uh, he's saying, yes, he's a, he, w- he will reward you. You can't be rewarded unless you're already born again. Um, that uh, rewarded positively, positively, that that is, uh, unless you already have a relationship with him. And um, and so, again, I, I think it's important to have that, that all through scripture. I see that is that based on a, a reality, based on a, a current reality, you know, reckon yourself dead, uh, dead to sin, alive to God. So now walk worthy of that, not 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 to attain something that you don't already have. But because you already have attained it, just like you said earlier with Paul, where he said, I run the race uh, uh, based on as if I already attained, but I already have attained it. I see that same principle also in Hebrews where he says, we who have believed have already entered that rest. And so he's telling them, hey, uh, you, we, we're already believers. Got your, you already have the title of a believer, an overcomer or, or, or a son of God. You already have that title. But now, because you've already entered that rest through faith, let's continue to press on to maturity through faith and, and on a daily basis, enter God's rest in that sense. Don't retreat back to the law, which is not rest. That's works. Let's move forward uh, and press forward to faith and trust God that he um, is leading us. And, and not, you know, we're not uh, we're not going to be like the people who uh, who received the uh, the the discouraging report from the spies that said, no, there's giants in the land. Uh, looks like God's going to lead is leading us into destruction, and so we're gonna we're not going to enter in. Um, so we're going to go back essentially to Egypt, essentially, um, or or stay right where we're at. And I think that's the warning um, that again, what Hebrews is basically saying. So again, the principle I'm trying to say is that um, all through the Bible, it, it, the exhortations are always based on a, on a current reality or past reality. You've already achieved the status, so now let's press on and walk worthy of that. That's all I have. Sorry. Hey, amen. 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 Like the song we were able to play last week for I am crucified with Christ. Uh, you know, not n- nevertheless, not I that liveth, but Christ that lives in me. So we've been we, we reckon ourselves dead. We, we believe ourselves that we have died and been raised with Christ already. And yet we wait to see the physical manifestation of that. It's already been done in heaven. We wait for the promise of that, which has already been done. Right. So, yes. Uh, and just to clarify, uh, I was spe- when I, when I said about sins unto death, I was specifically talking about physical death, that there's some things you can do in this life that will cause you death. But it's not, if you're saved, it's not eternal death. You, you cannot receive eternal death once you've received eternal life. If you go your entire life without believing, that unbelief your entire life is the spiritual sin unto eternal death. Just to clarify. Uh, so uh, first thing uh, in this... Uh, page uh, or document that that we're uh, attempting to go through, (laughs) Uh, the biblical order of salvation by faith on page two, Ephesians 1, 13 uh, says, in whom ye trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So, uh, I'd like us to break this down, and perhaps uh, if you want to bring up that passage uh, in in the in a Bible uh, uh, thing, so we can look at more of that passage, uh, perhaps in the the Blue Letter Bible, uh, BlueLetterBible dot org, we can look at that on Uh on your uh, computer. Let me do that one second. Um, okay. Uh, and then we can like break that down um, and and look at some of the context with that. Uh, and, and, but specifically I want to break that, that verse apart uh, grammatically 
and uh, what what order does that verse describe, and perhaps maybe what that passage describes, but specifically this verse, because it tells us an order of things. And God is a God of order. He is not a God of chaos um, when it comes to these things. So uh, God may create destruction and create calamity, but he does not, he is not a God of disorder. He is a God of order. That is a promise in scripture. That he is a God of order. So there's an order here in Ephesians one thirteen, And there's many other verses that, that speak of an order uh, to salvation. And they are in this document. Um, so we can, we can, we will get to those eventually. <laughs> Praise God. Okay, I have Blue Letter Bible up now for you. Okay, Ephesians 1. Okay, Ephesians 1. Oh, right, right. I have it up. All right. Okay, so Paul is speaking. This Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Right there. So Paul is speaking, he's, a, he's saying, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, I'm, I've been called by Christ, and I am speaking on behalf of Christ by the will of God. So this has been willed by the will of God. This is, this is uh, what God wants him to do. To the saints which are at Ephesus. And to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So, who is he talking to? Is he talking to the world? No. Because it says who it says who this letter is addressed to. So all of Ephesus, all of Ephesians is addressed to believers. That's extremely important when reading any of this. That this is addressed to believers, things that they should know and do. <clears throat> uh, which, which, you know, uh, I started this channel in talking about spiritual warfare. Your first warfare as a believer is, is the gospel. The, you don't even enter into spiritual warfare until you're a believer. Uh, truly. That's why Paul describes that spiritual warfare that happens in Romans seven, that, that there's, uh, and in Romans in general, but also in Ephesians, but that there's a, there's a war in your mind now that is, that is, uh, the war of the flesh versus the spirit. Okay. Once you've been saved, they are two opposing forces that are battling over your mind. So that they, the one wants you to do the will of God. And the other wants you to do the will of the flesh, which is sin and death. Okay, so there's a good example, just just from this verse. It directed me several different places. You're roboting a little bit, Steve. I don't know if you can okay. do it. Okay, yeah, for me too. Okay, okay. Uh, Lord bless the stream. Bless my connection with the internet, so people can hear me and I stop roboting. Thank you. The name is Jesus. Okay, how am I doing? Uh, I mean, we can hear you. It's just roboting a little bit, so so keep going. Keep going. Okay, um, as long as y'all can hear me and understand me. Um, okay, so uh, so just from this one verse, I went several places uh, because that's important in understanding these things that. The one thing I was going to say that that's a great takeaway from this, from what I was saying, that the war in your mind is evidence of your salvation. That you have the witness of the spirit within yourself and you have the witness of the flesh warring against each other, one trying to get you to, to do the will of God. <clears throat> and you learn that Romans 12 tells us how by by washing your mind with the renewing of God's word that way you will be able to test and approve what God's will is 
so you can line it up with what you're hearing and dismiss what the flesh is telling you through study of the Word of God. Uh, you know, study, study to show yourselves approved or workmen rightly dividing the Word of Truth. And it's not getting a little saved. bit worse. Okay. Um, I don't know. If, maybe if you, I don't. Can he hang up and come back in, or will that drop the stream? No, he could do that. No, that won't drop the stream. Okay, hold on. Okay, try doing that. Hold on. Okay. okay. We'll be here. I'm not sure. Yep. If, if, Angel will entertain us with her um, whistling abilities. Oh, no, I won't. I will not do that. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm I, actually not. Uh, he was roboting so bad with the end. I'm not actually sure where he where he left okay. off. There. Okay, okay. Let's see. A little, little bit better. better. Uh, better? Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, Quite a bit better. Got a little okay. bit of, yeah. Okay. Uh, am, am I roboting? Am I clear? Can you hear me? Just the tiniest bit of roboting, but 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 clear, much much clearer than uh, than you were. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And so, that, yeah, go on. Okay. Uh, so uh, basically, that the war that's in your mind because you have the witness of the spirit because mm -hmm. you're born again, and you have the witness of the flesh. That is a good marker to prove your your salvation within yourself if you have doubt because you struggle with sin or you have struggles but you still hear the voice of truth speaking within you to do right you also have yeah it's pretty bad, been, it's, it's pretty what? bad. Uh, what can he do yeah it got pretty bad there again it, it's like uh, it's fine when you, no, yeah it's fine when you stop good. and then yeah the, the devil. In the name of Jesus, Jesus. try to stop me from preaching this. Yeah, Lord, please, please come against whatever this this is. This is, um, you know, very. It's one of those things you can't actually uh, fix once it starts, unless it, <laughs> unless it be your will, Lord. So please, if you if you would uh, just uh, fix whatever's wrong. I'm not sure if Ben if Ben <laughs> if you can work through Ben here. Ben, do you know any type of way to to get uh, would make roboting stop once it starts. I mean, I don't know if that's like re, 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 uh, like reconnecting your Wi-Fi. I know that you're using your phone. Yeah, I'm not sure what his setup is, to, so it's hard to know. What is it a hot spot? I'm directly to my phone now. Yeah, it's he's using no his good. phone. It's still good. Still, uh, I don't know if you, are you flying down the uh, highway, or are is there a way you could stop? Or I'm not no, sure. I haven't moved. I haven't moved at all. Yeah, he's that's still he's hurt. Uh, I don't know if you can get outside your truck and walk around or something, or? Uh, uh, the, the only other, I mean, honest, sometimes if you reconnect, it, like sometimes if you turn on airplane mode and then uh, yeah. turn, turn on airplane mode and then turn it back off, um, sometimes okay. you'll, you'll get a better connection. I'm um, going to restart my phone, but... Uh, if that we we can take it, we can we can we can uh, fill fill in for you while you're going. Okay. Sure. Um, sure. Let yeah, me uh, so. go ahead and add it or in the first thing. Yeah, actually, do we know where we left off in Ephesians? Well, I think you just started with verse one. Um, okay. Do you want me to? Do you want me? Do you want to go off of what he was saying? Um, and I'm gonna get, or or do you want me to continue reading? Um, go to verse two, and we can. I'm not sure what, what we should do because I yeah, don't, I don't sure. want to skip ahead of him. Um, but uh, I, I see, yes, we we recently, the, during Wednesday's Bible study, we were actually in Ephesians and we've been uh, reading through Ephesians 1 through, uh, I think we got to 4 last night. Um, Steve, you there? He was, yes. Much better. Okay. Oh, yes. Airplane mode worked. Please, please, please the airplane start. thing worked. Okay. Great. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Lord. So, yes, thank you, Jesus. Um, uh, so, <clears throat> you were excuse, talking about um, how the war in your mind is evidence of your salvation. I know yeah, I was like the last. Yes, okay. yes, yes. That's what I was trying to 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 discuss or proclaim. That once you're saved, you are now born again of spirit, as as Jesus proclaims in John three. And that Paul talks about this war in your mind in Romans and 
in Ephesians to put on the full armor of God, uh, you know, and, and to study to show yourself approved unto God in Romans, uh, also in, in Timothy, uh, several places. Uh, there's so many places that talk about us uh, studying and walking with the Lord so that we begin to understand uh, the deeper truths of God so that we can rightly understand his will and hear his voice accurately so that when we hear these things in our mind that are, that in we have this war now that we're saved from two opposing voices they're totally contradictory towards each other the 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 voice of the spirit of truth and the voice of the flesh of death yes. and and I, it's amazing and how God will those, go about right. showing you that like to, right. showing you how to discern it because in my right. case, he, he actually would like, when the very beginning, I, um, there was a couple things that he told me that I guess were prophetic. I don't, I'm not one of the people that walks around saying I have prophetic visions or anything, uh, right. things that I had no way of knowing that mm -hmm. like a few months later materialized, like were real and, and like in a, in a very undeniable way. And I realized this, you know, it, it was actually kind of a frivolous thing about a certain celebrity dying. But it was him trying to show me like what, the difference between <laughs> between my imagination and his voice, because that was something right. I struggled with was trying to learn how to how to tell my own internal mm. thoughts from the Holy Spirit. So, so that's uh, I agree. This this understanding is a is a lifelong process, really. Amen. But the 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 most important thing I was getting at is that a lot of people struggle and think they're not saved because they still hear the voice of the flesh. They still oh. hear hear that voice that you're attached to because you live in that fleshly body that's telling you to go sin and do evil and do wicked things. That war that's occurring is a proof of your salvation. If you need something to understand that that war does not disprove your salvation, in a fact, it proves that you are saved because you have both. Instead of just the one telling you to go do and live your life however you want, etc. So that was like what I was was getting at, and all from Ephesians one one, because. Because I have done some studying, I can, you know, the, connect these two, these these passages. Um, but the the point was, because Paul writes Ephesians one, one, he's saying this is written to Ephesus, the saints which are in Ephesus. So this is all written to believers. So that's how we should read it. So with that context, things like putting on the full armor of God, putting on the helmet of salvation is not something that is written to an unbeliever to do. It's written to the saints. And at Amen. this time was written to those which were at Ephesus, but it is applicable to any saint. Exactly. <clears throat> so with that being my, in mind, if they're saints, they are saved. Um, so now we have that, that general context. Now we can look at verse 13 about the order of salvation. We can, we, well, we can look at more of it if you want. Uh, and if you guys have more to say about the context and all that, please share. Well, I just wanted to read them, um, um, a couple of verses in Romans, sure. um, Romans seven, uh, I guess we'll do 19 and 20, um, for the good that I, that I would do that I for the good that I would I do not but the evil which I would not that I do now if I do that I would not it is no more I that do it but sin that dwelleth in me I find then a law that when I would do good evil is present with me now obviously that that talks about the two natures and so this the, you know Paul even Paul is having a struggle between the flesh and the spirit um, and he's having that voice that tells him um, he has one voice telling him, you know, the good that he would do and one voice telling him, uh, you know, the, the voice of the flesh that still tempts him to do evil. And we think Paul was, uh, you know, one of the one of the saintliest people we can even imagine in terms of all the work he did for God. But even he had that struggle. So um, 
having you know the 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 flesh still uh kind of nipping at your heels Amen. when it comes to your walk i mean this is this is inescapable uh, it, to, to say otherwise is it, you know it might as well be lordship damnation um to, to 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 you know to even extend that into your mental life to where you're not even allowed to have um uh the, the you know the thoughts that come with being in the flesh, you know, doubts or, or a lack of faith. I mean, that's, that's actually raising the bar higher than the Lordshippers raise it in terms of, of, of proving salvation, because they tend to only look at, you know, the, the sin that you actually carry out doing, or even the, the sin you do on purpose, as, you know, uh, but to, to, to try to, to try to doubt someone's salvation based on their mental life. I mean, that's, that's just a ridiculously impossible bar to set. So um, I agree with what you're saying. Yeah. Also, too. Um, well said. And also, too, like Steve said, the the opening uh, first few sentences of every epistle tells you exactly who he's talking to. And so there's there's some that would assert that, oh no, uh, you got to read every sentence as to, and you got to arbitrarily decide if it's to the wheat or the yeah. tares. Um, and uh, that makes interpretation nearly impossible. Um, and well, it, not, not only I think it makes it wrong. But it, it, it makes it impossible because you can't know for yeah. sure who's exactly talking to. But he tells you in the first sentences of every epistle who exactly he's referring to. And whenever yeah. there, the, the, there's a rule. And, and I, again, I would encourage everyone to test this out and see if it's so. Uh, but it's certainly a rule that I found is that whenever one of the epo- uh, epistle writers is talking about unbelievers, they always talk to, to them in the third person he talks to the church in the in the first or second person but unbelievers are always in the third person and they always use terms like give an uh, example of of third and second just in case people don't know uh well uh second person speak of themselves in the third person right so uh second person would be like you uh us Mm -hmm. um where third person is them they They, um And so when it's talking about unbelievers, it, again, it's always in the third person and it uses terms like sons of disobedience, sons of wrath, accursed as children, things of that nature. So it's 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 not ambiguous at all. Um, no. all it's assumed, I believe, again, every epistle, including Hebrews, is written to believers, talking about yeah. believers. Um, and when it's, again, when it's talking about unbelievers, it's always in the third person. Um, and there are there are occasions I, I I believe there are occasions that when even believers in some uh, it, it's kind of an exception but in some cases they are they do refer to some um, unbelievers who go apostate in the third person um, but uh, again that's the exception but the general rule is uh, it, if it's directed towards believers especially current believers mm-hmm. believers people who are believing now it's the opening letter tells you exactly any like any good author they tell you in the opening sentences. Who it's to, and what the overall theme of the epistle is going about, going to be about. So if you ignore that, you, those two uh, opening sentences, uh, I think you're gonna, you're already off on the wrong foot. Well, so. imagine if you're writing a letter. No, nobody went to and try to write a letter where where the, the the person you're directing it to jumps around from sentence to sentence. First of all, you're writing a letter. You're writing a letter to one audience. You know, <laughs> typically, right. you know, it's not going to be. You're not going to send one one letter that's written to several different people unless they're part of one whole. Um, that and you're sending a copy of that letter to multiple people in that whole, but you're not going to send a letter to 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 uh, uh, your I don't know to your to your your family and to your worst enemy and and you know and have it be the same letter addressing both of them and they just have to guess which one you're addressing from sentence to sentence but not only would would paul not do that i mean paul is that he you know he's a very exacting thorough person as we can see from the scriptures uh, but god especially would do that it's ridiculous to act like he's going to do that in these epistles where he's going to allow that kind of confusion to come in and that's why that, 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 you know, God is so clear with everything. We say that all the time in terms of, you know, how we have to know that salvation is either all works or all grace. It, ha- it has to be because God is very clear and he makes everything, he's so exact in everything because he knows we have to know this. We have to know, we have to be able to tell for sure. These things are important. It's 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 life or death, literally eternal life or eternal death. And um, so the idea of just, just to, to uh, you know, basically, for your own purposes to try to divvy up who these letters are addressing based on the sentences with no actual, 
you know, way to verify one way or the other, just basically in terms of what, 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 whether it serves your doctrine or not, it's ridiculous. It's, 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 you know, they're, they're either two believers or they're not, you know, they're either to the Gentiles or they're not. Um, right. um, in terms, in terms of, uh, you know, although I'm sure there's times where there's going to be a mixed audience and we all know that, that of course, of course, he's going to be speaking. There's going to be people that might be there that aren't actually believers. He knows that too. But when he's addressing something, for instance, I, well, I believe it's in Hebrews, right? Is it in Hebrews where he's talking about, um, apostasy and we're talking of, you know, the thing that you brought up where, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it, yeah, I think it was in Hebrews that you were, that kind of got into an argument. Um, uh, with uh, a certain person about this, um, he he's he's addressing directly believers about you know them going into basically apostasy into some sort of um, but yeah huh is that is that the right is yeah. it Galatians okay it's Galatians um and and um I can't remember what the argument was about but the point is is that the the thing that he's talking about the apostasy the the, the false doctrine that that they're they're going into and he's still addressing them as brothers and sisters, whether or not every single person in that crowd is, you know, a brother or a sister is not the point. The point is, is that what he, the behavior he's addressing, uh, if he's still addressing them as believers, that means it doesn't, you know, that behavior does not disqualify you as being a believer. That's why he's addressed, you know, that's why it's important to understand who uh, these epistles address, because that way you can know, whether or not a certain thing would would disqualify somebody from being a believer. That's why we're trying to hammer this home because he's not going to be addressing believers as believers while discussing things that only unbelievers can do. Right. Hey, amen. Amen. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out with what you were talking about with Romans that Paul wrote about his own personal struggle with doing right and not the two natures That's, yeah with, with that two natures that he describes at war within himself that was the last letter he wrote on his way to die wow that's important to understand yep. it's the very last thing he wrote because it, and it gives us that even in the even in the writing, because he talks about, I'm on my way to, to you, want to be with you, you know, uh, and, and in the context of Acts, it's literally when he's on the ship uh, that breaks apart because the devil's trying to keep him from getting there. <clears throat> so that's his last voyage where he, you know, he writes this. Um, so, uh, that's that's important to to understand that 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 was and and you can look that up historically as well. Some might argue that, but the overwhelming majority of scholars believe that Romans was the last letter Paul wrote, which bears uh, extreme importance on that because there are some who would say Paul's writing this before he got saved which is absolutely preposterous for Paul to, to have written that before he got saved when he was murdering Christians. And you know, know, Paul's, I have never heard anybody argue that. That's crazy. Oh, That's I have. Yeah. Well, the people we know yeah. well uh, do. He can but, see Christ face to face. Oh, no way. Right. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. That's insane. So, I never. So, I Wow. Yeah. Which, which, which makes even just on the fact that, Paul was murdering Christians up until he was on his way to murder Christians it, when he was uh, in, when he encountered the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. He wasn't seeking so, God at that point. That's for sure. He was seeking no, to he kill, was huh? seeking to kill. Oh, which, yeah, well, which is the argument that should be addressed is that that that, that, that he was he was knowledgeable about God. That 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 was you know all the time that he was murdering Christians and that he was uh, you know basically you know studying and and believing himself to obey the law that 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 was I guess that was seeking because he was you know he thought he was doing the truth that's the argument that they use so I don't know if you guys have anything yeah, for that, that but that is important to address the direct argument. That's like yeah. saying 
I'm going to go out and kill people in an attempt to seek God. Or that's like saying, I'm going to go out and uh, uh, buy a prostitute tomorrow to seek God. I'm going to go out yep. and, uh, you know, uh, shoot myself up with heroin in order to try to seek God. That's what well, by that argument, the, by the, that. the Jews should have no problem believing because they are uh, they they're knowledgeable about the you know the oh. law, mosaic law. You know what I mean? Like, are they seeking? Oh. Um, but also, yeah, also oh. the, uh, that was, the fact that, that you could God see the risen sent. Christ and not be a believer yet. That was God sent. Just why? Yep. Uh, oh, oh, there's a verse on that. I know there is. Oh. Uh, keep keep talking. I got to find this verse. Well, what oh, I was oh. saying was that basically, you know, the argument is that that because you you have to have some knowledge of the scripture. It, it changes a lot, but you have to have some knowledge of the scripture in order to understand accurately enough to believe. But um, what we know what did it for for Paul was he literally was stopped in his tracks by the risen Christ. He, he saw Christ face to face. And in, in fact, you know, uh, some people might even say that that he, uh, he didn't have to have faith because he knew because Christ manifested before him. Um, but we certainly, we certainly, I've never heard anybody argue that he didn't, he didn't become a believer at that point. That's what changed him. Why would he have done any of the things he did subsequent to that if he wasn't a believer in Jesus? Uh, I, I'm just, I'm taken aback by that argument. I'd never even heard that before. I thought it was with the other apostles that they would make the argument that they weren't saved until whenever point was suitable for, for what they were teaching, you know, but, um, but the idea that just because, you know, Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees that, that that gave him enough understanding or, or I don't know, seeking points in order to have um, believed without seeking or, or that counted as seeking in his case. I mean, you know, the, the, the all we see while Christ was actually, you know, during his earthly ministry, um, prior to his crucifixion, he was constantly contending with the Pharisees, and they were seeing miracles done before their very eyes, uh, and they weren't believing. So I don't understand um, how how Paul could have been considered to be seeking in this time where he was persecuting Christians, but the Pharisees themselves, you know, what, what, you know, we wouldn't consider you know them to have been seeking God's truth. Um, right. because they were actively denying it. They were, they were, they were willfully denying it at the point where, where they were seeing these miracles done and they still wanted, uh, they wanted Christ, you know, uh, put away or, or killed, uh, because he was an inconvenience to, you know, basically their worldview, their worldview that the Messiah was going to, was going to come and conquer the world for them. And, that they were going to be delivered to an earthly kingdom when the Messiah came, and, and certainly not that that the, the you know this promise would be open to the Gentiles. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I you're, that just caught me off guard, Ben. I don't know if you have more to more to say on that about the idea that Paul wasn't saved at at, the, at that point. He wasn't saved until when? Until right before he died. What what, what was the argument? Yeah, in fact, uh, he would. Uh, yeah, so the, the argument is, I believe that where they teach that Romans six and seven, where Paul uh, relates his struggle, as a, I believe it, I'm totally convinced that uh, I think uh, you guys would all agree that it, he's relating his struggle as a new believer to understand the relationship. You know, he he was so accustomed to the law, he was trying to figure out where the law fit in. He knew it couldn't justify anyone, but he, he was now struggling with, okay, on my daily walk, where does the law fit in, I believe? And he focused on that, and when he focused on that in his walk, uh, he found that it only uh, aroused sin, and um, he couldn't get defeat. He, he was experiencing defeat after defeat after defeat, and finally came to the end of themselves, and that's we said, who's going to rescue me from this body of death? He basically cried out to God for mercy, and then he says, "Ah, but like like Steve said, but God, uh, you know, He uh, through the Holy Spirit, He is able to um, strengthen him and and showed him basically it's it's basically setting your mind on the things of the Spirit, not the things of the law. Because if you set your minds on the things of the law, which is kind of code for things of the flesh, it's going to uh, it, it brings about death. It leads to death, whereas things of the Spirit." Uh, brings about life, and he was learning that struggle. I believe as an early Christian, like we all. So they're do. claiming the fact that he was having questions about that struggle. Um, that 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 proved that he wasn't saved yet. Is that what you're saying? 
I don't know the reasoning, honestly. That I don't. Uh, but because I see that as a rhetorical device when he's talk, yeah. when he's relating his experience, he's relating his experience to these people, so he understands, so that they understand. That, well, first right. that, he's, that he relates to what they're going through, but also yeah. just you walk somebody through your thought process to show you how God yeah. show them how God delivered you. God, God um, showed you the answer um, yeah. to this struggle that we have. I, I don't I mean you know I, that's crazy. I can't believe that anybody would would. I had never heard that. I had never well, heard I, that. That's the thing too, is that I've been hearing things that like, I was like really jaw droppingly uh, confounding. It's like, they, that's what they really believe. Um, uh, these are you things recently? I recently? Yes. Yes. Uh, all kinds of stuff. Oh. Like, uh, like, like Steve said last week. About the huh? <laughs> I'm sorry. Keep going. You found I it? Found the verse. Yes. Okay. I found the verse I was looking for. First uh, Corinthians 8, 1. Now is touching things offered unto idols, we know that we have we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Knowledge puffeth up, but yep. charity edifieth. So what knowledge is that? Of the law. Of the law. Yep. And these deep ears, esoteric, Gnostic, uh, mysticist, mystical uh, things that they think they see in Scripture that are not only misunderstood, but uh, not just not true. Um, but it, it pops right. up. Yeah, right. but also that shows that that knowledge of the law does not edify. So no amount of him being knowledgeable about the about the law would have been sufficient to show him the truth of 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 the of Jesus Christ of of the Messiah. Uh, because it can only puff you up. And we see that, you know, even today, we see that now. So, um, you know, uh, the, the more knowledgeable people are about the law, the more mm-hmm. blind they are to grace. And so uh, that we're, we're saying all that to show that, no, it wasn't that, you know, it wasn't Paul's extensive knowledge of the law that uh, that counted mm-hmm. as his seeking process or, or, or made him able to have the deep understanding required to, to be saved. Um, it was, uh, you know, well, it was his encounter with, with Jesus, but just, just in the case of the Gentiles too, the Gentiles believed much more easily than, than the Jews ever did. Um, and yeah. still to this day, that's true because the knowledge of the law could not edify. It just, it just puffs you up, makes you prideful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and it's not wrong to have knowledge of God, but if that's all you have, or even knowledge of the law, if that's all it doesn't you have, give you a leg up. It doesn't give you a leg up. It does not give you salvation. Knowledge does not give you salvation. Nope. Not uh, at all. Not at all. Knowledge is what you need to believe on what you understand. But there's yeah. not a whole lot you must understand in order to be saved. We we learn more in order to better understand our salvation and how we should walk, yes. But we must be careful that we do not let that knowledge puff us up into being prideful over another. Right, and, and the, 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 the what you need to understand. First in the body, and then of our view of those in the world. But the understanding mm. people really need, it's not a, it's not a, it's not in really a, a, an old Testament understanding or a really a scriptural understanding in my experience, which really doesn't define anything. Unlike what it seems to me, it's a, a lot of people seem to believe is that their experience defines the gospel. But um, from my experience, I will say that uh, all I needed to understand was the, the problem, the situation I was in. Uh, the problem of being a sinner, of being mortal, um, of, 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 of needing a savior. That's, that's really the, the understanding required, I believe, uh, for, for people to actually, you know, uh, come to, to faith. They have to at least have that, that um, which is something I think everybody has. Everybody has the understanding to varying degrees uh, uh, that, that, you know, that there's a problem, you know, w- with humanity. Humanity is in a, in a, in a pretty bad situation um, with, uh, with this death thing that we all we all have hanging over our head every day, and and it really uh, robs you of all joy. That you know, the more you think of it, the more you actually 
um, are, are, are mature enough to understand the reality of it. You know, the younger we are, the, the more we think somehow that we're immortal, that, that we're invincible. But the more you realize that death is a reality that's, you know, closing in on all of us and could come at any moment. There's like no guarantee of tomorrow, not, not whatsoever. Um, that uh, is, is, is crucial in accepting, you know, the gospel, the, the gift of eternal life and why you even need it. But this idea that having, it, having a knowledge of, of the law or of, you know, extensive, extensive knowledge of scripture, you know, I mean, if that were the case, it, just think of all the people that are, 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 are raised in these extremely legalistic um, uh, religions. We often say they are the most difficult to get saved. Why is that? Why is that? They have such an, ex a lot of them, you know, they memorize scripture from the time they're really little because, because, uh, you know, th their parents teach them that, you know, God is this, this, this angry, uh, judge threatening, uh, you know, fire and brimstone at every turn. And, and no matter amount, no matter how much they believe in him or, or even trust him they, <laughs> that they, you know, they take a, a wrong turn and they could fall right into hell. And so they 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 beat the scripture into, into their heads from a young age, and all this fear and and you know knowledge of the law. And we say that those people we often call them like lordship lordship types, but some they're just straight up like legalistic. You know, I think lordship they believe that you basically they backload the works, right? So you have to work to to maintain salvation rather than attain it. But either way, these are people that are steeped in the law, and we we all have agreed. At one point or other, that they're often the most difficult to save. So how could we say that this knowledge actually, um, um, it, you know, is what is required in order to make someone mm -hmm. understand and believe? It's it's really in a lot of times it's, it's the opposite. The opposite is true. It all just depends on the person. Everybody has a different thing they need to understand in terms of it's like one little thing that has to click in order for them to get to really get the gospel message. Uh, you know, I, it, but, but the point is, is that the hearing of the gospel is what does it. That's what does it. It's, you know, Amen. Not <laughs> Amen. I was going to address that earlier when, when we were talking about, you know, the whole, how you preach the gospel uh, and to not be so concerned. I mean, you should be concerned yes. that you're presenting the, the points of the gospel, but in, in, and making sure you say it exactly right to lean on the Holy Spirit. And there's there's two verses that you can stand on as promises uh, in that what you're preaching. Um, as long as you are hitting the points of what is in Scripture, you are preaching the Word of God. Actually, three. Um, the power the first, of God and the salvation. Right, right. The gospel is the power. So you're not preaching of yourself. You're preaching yep. the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. And then uh, also, secondly, that God's word does not return unto him void or without effect or without purpose. So it will go out and accomplish to that yep. which it is sent. Um, and then you don't thirdly, like a skeleton key. Right, right, exactly. And thirdly, that uh, that God chose, like we talked about last last week, God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe. Mm -hmm. So those those three promises that you can stand on when you proclaim the gospel in your language. That's that's those are great verses to stand on. Yeah. They're also great verses to stand on when you proclaim scripture over your life. When you per, when you pray scripture about things going on in your life, which is why it's so important to know God's word so that when you pray, you pray in alignment with God's word. Then you can trust that all things you have prayed for will be accomplished when you stand on the authority of God's word and his promises. That's why Jesus said uh, two things when you pray, that, that you often don't get what you ask for because you don't ask, number one. Number two, you ask amiss. You ask in disalignment with the will of God. What is the will of God? His word. So if you pray, 
what the Bible has promised, and all the promises of God to believers are yea and amen, you can stand on those with a surety. <clears throat> Which is, which is the origin of the, quote, word of faith uh, movement. That's the origin are those scriptures. It went off on a, a train wreck when it started using that to proclaim when you speak something, it will be when it fell out of line with speaking those things that are not as though they were which is scripture, when it doesn't line up with the word of God, that's where it falls, where it fell off the train tracks of this biblical manner of proclaiming the truth as though it were. Like, uh, if, it's, if it's in the Bible, if it's a promise to believers that uh, I will see the salvation of my children before I die. I will see the salvation of my, of my children while in the land of the living. I, I proclaim that I profess that in the name of Jesus. And then I will walk by that word and I will keep asking and keep asking and keep asking and keep standing on that in the name of Jesus as though it's already been done. <clears throat> There's two things that Jesus, te one thing Jesus teaches us and one thing Daniel teaches us about prayer. And they're the same thing. You don't stop asking, but you keep asking as if it's already happened. Like the woman who went to the judge over and over and over again till she wore the judge out to give her what she asked. Daniel kept praying for the same thing and God, as a result of his continued prayer, sent an answer and then sent more reinforcements to make sure the answer got to Daniel. That's, so that's just a side note there. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, there was Sorry, another no, verse no, I looked no, up. No. Oh, <clears throat> uh, Jesus speaks uh, along with this topic of understanding. Uh, or, or knowing the scriptures and that being some, uh, pre, uh, some prerequisite for, uh, salvation or belief. And that be just because they knew the scriptures and they're, they're in their flesh trying to do that, that they somehow have eternal life. No, just because you know the truth don't mean you're, you're going to be saved. Uh, like with that whole argument with Paul or, or whoever, uh, John five thirty nine, Jesus says to the scribes and Pharisees, search the scriptures. He's telling them to search, but this is to the scribes and Pharisees, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. In, 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 in what? Jesus is pointing out that they thought they had eternal life in the scriptures because they knew the scripture. They thought they were saved by what they knew. And he says, no, they, the scriptures are what testify of me being eternal life. Jesus Amen. is eternal life. He's saying, y'all think y'all are saved because of what you know. It's wrong. If all you got is the knowledge and you don't believe in who it's talking about, you ain't saved. Yep. Yep. That's so the that's thing. That's clear, what that's what you need to know. You need to know what they testify of Christ, which is which is that He is mm -hmm. the way of eternal life. That's what yeah. you have to know. Not not the scriptures themselves. And exactly. you know exactly that's, that's what the gospel is a shortcut to. Exactly. That's why right. we proclaim it and teach it and preach it so that they hear and can believe. That's why it's literally, Paul says, it's with your physical ear that you hear the gospel in Romans 10. Right. It's when, you turn, it's when you turn to Christ uh, is when the veil is lifted and all that knowledge that you have is, is made useful. Uh, but 
without right. without turning to Christ, right. that knowledge is useless. Right. So when someone has studied the scripture a lot, but hasn't believed it yet, and then eventually they do believe it, they come to that place, a moment where they inwardly kneel and hum in humility to Christ, because God hates even the look of pride. So that's important. A broken and contrite heart, God will not despise. He will not look down on, or, or, uh, but a pride look, he will look down on. Like, not looking down, like, as if I'm above you looking down, but he won't, uh, a broken heart and contrite, a broken and contrite heart, God will not despise, meaning he will see you. A pride, a proud full heart that doesn't admit they need a savior, that doesn't admit they're a sinner. That's what it, that's what it used to mean to turn from your sin. And I think that's what most people that say, turn from your sin and believe, repent and believe. I think most people that have a basic understanding, and if we teach it this way in the right way, According to scripture, that that turning from sin is understanding your need for a savior, that you are a sinner. Do you need a savior? And you turn to Christ in faith. In effect, you are turning from your sin or your trust in something sinful that that is that has the beginning place of idolatry. So it is turning from sin to Christ, but not in the way a lordship teaches that you have to stop sinning in order to believe, or you have to believe and stop sinning in order to keep it. Either way is wrong. You're turning from trust in anything else to trust in Christ alone. And that's why, you know, but I was, what I was trying to say before I went off on that tangent, uh, which I have a propensity to do, is uh, that that if someone comes to faith after having learned a lot of scripture and knowledge of scripture, then yes, you now are stepping into grace and stepping into faith in stepping into salvation with all this knowledge, like Ben was saying, that you now have the use of in right manner, that God will open up what you've read in deeper, uh, in deeper ways and more and deeper understanding. But that doesn't mean that that knowledge was required because Jesus is saying all the scripture which, when he's speaking this, was the Old Testament. The New Testament ain't been written yet. So all the scripture in the Old Testament was talking about grace through faith in Jesus. That that's the point of all the scripture, was to get you to Jesus. So we can, we don't, you can bypass, you don't have to, I mean, you're not technically bypassing it, when we preach the gospel, we are summing up the Old Testament in the gospel. That Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. That's summing what we're summing up. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We're summing all of it up. The Old Testament was, it includes the law. And, and, and so that's like the point is that if we preach Christ, we're preaching right, and people can believe and be saved. We don't have to preach knowledge, but preaching about Christ is great and what he did, but preaching the scriptures for salvation. And that's what Jesus is saying in John five thirty nine. You search the scriptures by all means, but Hey buddy, they talk about me. So just, just come to me for eternal life. I got gotcha. you. If you would, but just come to me. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, I know I go off on tangents, so 
Yeah, for well, me, it was, wasn't much. We I, I re- the verse 13 yet. <laughs> I, re- I require just enough of Genesis, just like, you know, just like the first, uh, you know, part of Genesis. I mean, I, I, you know, I was going off of memory. So um, that was, that was, you know, just enough to understand the fall um, and, and, and how it explained the human condition from memory was enough in, in, in addition to the gospel for me to be saved and believe. You know, um, that, that's, uh, you know, not, not a whole lot, not a whole lot. That was just, you know, and that was just for me personally. Some people don't need any of that. Um, and, uh, I, you know, that, that had to do with me growing up in a, in a Christian society. Of course that does help, but, uh, I was not, you know, an extensive, uh, you know, like a student <laughs> of scripture at all. When I was a kid, I, you know, I, I ran my mouth so much as a kid that my family stopped making me go to church, stop, they shouldn't have, but they stopped making me go to church, stopped making me go to Sunday school, but just, just having that, that bare minimum knowledge of, of just the basics of Genesis was, uh, was enough for me personally, uh, to, 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 to see why the gospel was true, but, um, uh, I had no idea of the shadows of Christ in the Old Testament, I didn't, all of that stuff came later, and that, that, you know, it comes, uh, like in waves where God will just open my understanding to things um, that uh, that further prove to me, you know, the, the, the reality of eternal security. And but see, I, I you know, I always uh, in my heart knew that, that it would have to be eternal security or nothing because it would like God's love would have to be perfect um, in order for, it, you know, for, in my opinion, for for God to be God, He would have to have a love that was greater than that of my family. It's what you know. It's, how, it's one of the ways that I knew that my family loves you know always loved me unconditionally. So, um, but you know the idea. That's why it's, I said the the gospel is kind of like a skeleton key because everybody has a different lock, but the gospel can unlock any of them uh, just by the hearing of it. That's how it was designed. That's why it is the power of God unto salvation. So, um, uh, you know, and it really is like a like a shortcut through the scriptures. That's why we we call the the New Testament the Old Testament revealed. Um, and it's really revealed in the gospel itself. Uh, and it was, it, you know, made quick and easy specifically for the Gentile world, knowing, especially if you really go back and you can't look at this from a, a modern and Western, particularly American perspective where, where we have all of this, uh, kind of Christian foundation growing up in this country. Um, at the time, that the gospel went out to the Gentiles initially, they had no such foundation. Um, the Jews were a very small minority of people with a very strange religion that, you know, in a pagan world. And yet we see, um, you know, so many people uh, believed. And then we hear historically how many people believed through the, through the persecution of the church. Um, how much understanding do you think they had of scripture at a time that pe- most people were not literate? And there was no, <laughs> there was no printed word. Um, it was something about the gospel itself being preached that somehow caused. And it, 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 it astounds me to this day, imagining pagan societies, especially, you know, so you know, like like you know, two thousand years ago, understanding, uh, you know, understanding the gospels weren't even made sense to them. That's how you know it's a supernatural thing. It's a supernatural design. That the you know that God the way God designed the gospel was that it would work it would work on people without any extensive study because that's not a luxury afforded to most people throughout the majority of human history so we've touched on that but I just don't think that can be hammer home Indeed. enough because it's just so Indeed. so so uh, uh, ridiculous to think that, that most people are ever gonna most people who've ever existed are not gonna have that foundation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, someone did make the valid point in the chat that people did uh, learn orally way more back then, and they knew yes. a lot. That they a lot of people did know a lot of scripture, but that don't mean that scripture saved them. Which was Jesus' point. He's saying y'all can know all the scripture you want, but if you don't believe in who they testify of, you ain't got eternal life. Are you saying like pagan life. societies did? Because I know that 
I know that the, or, you know, when it right. comes to no, like, the I'm Jews, not saying of course. Pagan society did. I'm yeah. saying. <laughs> I mean, that's what I was talking about, right? Generally <laughs> speaking, generally speaking, uh, if you look at Jewish tradition, most children oh, absolutely. Uh, had the entire Bible, uh, the Old Testament, memorized by like 12, 13, 14. Oh, yeah. That's so, for the Jews, but we see how much good that did them. Right. Right, exactly. And that, that, that was, I believe that was exactly Jesus' point. He's talking to scribes and Pharisees who knew the scriptures backwards and forwards, yet they had not eternal life because they didn't trust in the one in whom they spoke of. They should and have known. And why is it that the ones with the least amount of knowledge believe the easiest and the most quickly, especially compared to... Because the verse, yep, the verse, knowledge puffeth up. I did want to give two verses real quick to, to, to the whole thing about children not being able to be saved. Uh, Matthew 10, uh, Matt, Matthew, Matthew 10, 14, Matthew, or, uh, Matthew 19, 14, Mark 10, 14, and Luke 8, 18, 16. Uh, but Jesus called unto them, called them unto him and said, suffer, little children to come unto me and forbid them not for such is the kingdom of, of God. <laughs> he, uh, he does, you know, it, it is important to point out, he's saying that they are, uh, that, that to, to believe as children. Yes. He says that in the passage, but Jesus specifically says, Suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not. Do not forbid them to come to me. Second verse. So that's important. And he's about he's saying not to come to Jesus if you're a child is blaspheming the word of God, is blaspheming the word of Jesus. You are in direct opposition. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Then take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. Remember, we've talked about in John 3, Jesus says, you're born again of spirit. This is soul rest. Matthew 28 is spirit rest. Just wanted to point that out. Um, but if you come unto Jesus and he gives you rest and you're pro you are forbidding them, you are forbidding children to come to Jesus, you are forbidding them salvation. That is blasphemy. Also, Go too, ahead, the, uh, yeah, sorry. The, uh, the thing I hear a lot, too, again, they always appeal to anecdotes and uh, metaphors that are not uh, biblical. For example, uh, they'll say things like, well, you can't believe in somebody you don't trust. Are you kidding me? Uh, Romans, um, yes, that's true in general in, in, in our general relations with fallen mankind. But it, 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 the gospel itself, it reveals the righteousness of God. And if you it, it, the gospel itself, like I said, reveals the righteousness of God. If you can't trust perfect righteousness, then you, there's something fundamentally, uh, you know, wrong in your thinking. And I don't think anyone uh, is that, uh, that short circuited because it says in Romans 1, uh, 16 through 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek for it, it, the righteousness of God is revealed. So, the gospel itself reveals the righteousness of God and the, the very essence of righteousness is trust. Amen. And, and uh, I mean, it, it's encapsulated in the gospel itself. So um, you, if you understand the gospel, you realize you're a sinner. God's not. He paid for your sin. And, and, and how much trust does that really take? I mean, uh, it, the, 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 to realize what God had to do to send his own son to die for your sins, for everyone's sins, because no one's righteous. There's no law that could save everyone. There's no law that could give life. Only through faith can you be, uh, can you receive life. And that's why it says, for in it, uh, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. 
and has written the just that so you were about, I was about to say that you should finish that and, and yeah. go on with the faith to faith thing because I, I I wanted you to I, I knew if you stopped short of that some people would claim that you were trying to dance around that as if that proved something but uh, I oh, no. think we should maybe touch on on that uh, no. what that really says yes yeah, so from faith to faith I believe it it, it it could for me I think there's two interpretations that it could possibly mean and I, I I lean towards this one and and it's both but both are supported by the context but it doesn't mean uh your faith and God's faith join together um it doesn't mean that at all that's uh I don't know where that's pulled out from but there's no other verse that even alludes to that and to suggest that this verse does completely ignores the context because the context is right up uh, all through Romans 1 through that verse is talking about the spread of the gospel, the, the progressive uh, spread of the gospel where one's justifying faith shared with another person gives them the justifying faith. And that's why uh, the just shall live by faith is that, in fact, the just shall live by faith. It, uh, if, the, if you study the Greek, I, I've looked at it, it actually could be uh, understood as by faith, the just shall live. By the justifying faith, it's not that the, that the faith, the, the the just shall live by faith in terms of their walk. That's certainly true, but it actually uh, is uh, uh, emphasizing by faith, the justifying faith that person shall live. In other words, they're, yes, they're born again, eternal life. Yes, yes, yes that too. And then also, the so, shall live. Period, because you're dead. And indeed, in indeed, it is by both. Faith. Indeed, it, it is both. It is both in your walk. We are to walk out by faith and we also live by faith we mm -hmm. live because we believe yep. um uh and another thing yet again in romans uh romans 1 verse uh 7 to all that be in rome beloved of god called to be saints grace to you and peace from god our father and the lord jesus christ that's who he wrote that to. That's who he wrote the whole book of Romans to is to the saints. So he explains a lot of things yes. about about stuff. And he does address it to to all that be in Rome. Um, but he he specifically is saying this is directed towards saints for your further understanding of the gospel for your further understanding of the truth um that's that's basically you know what what he's you know addressing but i do love that um but is it revealed for there in the, is the righteousness of god revealed from faith to faith how how is that revealed from the preaching of faith they that believe that's how it's revealed I preach and the also, gospel with my faith. People hear it. They believe. There's their faith. Faith to faith. Reproductive first. Yes. So, reproducing faith, which is another yes. thing about when, when, when faith without works is dead in the sense that, you know, to, for something to count as being alive, it has to reproduce. And right. so... Re Without works, which which count gospel and, and giving and giving a testimony is, is works. Is, is that, that, without without doing that, you won't reproduce your faith. Um, that's what I, a little being a biology major. That was always the first thing that I thought when I would hear that verse. Um, and I did. Yeah. Yes, and also I did want to say too. We know that when, until Paul, people like like Paul was the one who drove home the fact that. That it's you know that we're saved you know um, by our faith apart from and in spite of our own works apart from and in spite of our own works. Paul hammered that home. So our, our, oh, yeah. until until he did that, are we to believe nobody was saved? You know what I mean? Like because because if right? if, if, if just the hearing of the gospel, you know, and this deep gnostic oh, understanding, so you know what I mean? Yeah, because I, I was just thinking about what you know the completion that we found in his in his epistles. Um, right. How could any have been one been saved before that? 
it, you know, without that complete understanding. I mean, that he that's because that's what he was there to do was fully, you know, further edify the saints about about the gospel and the nature of their salvation. But they already had it. But then if you think about all oh, that, so good. Go Given on, yeah, context, go on. Right. Yeah, go on. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Given the context of knowing that that he's writing things that that the Holy Spirit has inspired him to write. Yes. Just like he inspires us to preach the truth as we learn it more. That that he was writing things that he believed that hadn't been addressed. Yes. Through the through the leading of the Holy Spirit that were uh the most important things to address. Absolutely. Like if you take the, the that's why to say the Romans road uh for belief to preach the Romans road is heresy is heresy to preach to say that because yeah. this is the yeah. final summation of of the man of God that was called specifically to be set apart for the gospel that's what he actually says in in Romans 1 uh verse 1 Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. This is the one who who God appointed specifically for the task of, of uh, proclaiming the gospel and being and having the dispensation of the mystery of Christ revealed unto him mm-hmm. to preach it. Yep. Which was why a thorn was left in his side to keep him humble because of the knowledge he was mm-hmm. given. So yeah. important because that knowledge could have puffed up Paul. That he was dispensed. That yeah, that, we don't hear him ever imply no one was saved until he came right, along. Right, right. Or until he wrote Romans. Every other letter is written to the saints at such and such a place. Right. So, I mean, you know, I'm right. surprised even with us that believing eternal security. Oh, that's so good, Angel. That was so good that you put that out there. That was so good. That <laughs> is you. so, Im- like, that just destroys the whole, you got to know all this stuff. No, you need yeah. to know Jesus. You need to know of Jesus. It even that's humbles us a bit with the eternal security stuff because we know until Paul hammered that home there had to have been plenty of people that were questioning these things you know how we we That's use Paul's epistles yes. Yeah. yeah yeah we use his epistles to prove eternal security 9 out of 10 times and so right. so before those things you know were written how you know I'm, people probably were not clear on these things that did not mean they weren't saved mm-hmm. Because so, there were some that came in to spy out their liberty, like Galatians mm-hmm. says, to exactly. to destroy and shipwreck their faith. So Paul comes along and writes a letter to confirm their faith, to confirm their salvation, to address the arguments of the devil. Of the devil. That's what he's doing. And so this is his last letter he wrote in Romans. And he's addressing all these points. It's like Romans is probably, if you read Romans front to back, it is the most exhaustive yes. sermon on 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Yeah, I think it's, a, I think it's the most, I consider it the most scientific uh, statement of salvation. It explains yep. predicament, the law. The, the 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 where the law is uh where, where the law's place is in in the in the life of a believer and the salvation of a believer i think it, it yeah exactly it, it's the most scientific statement um i think it to me it, it's one that i go to peri- often because it's so it talks a lot about identification truths and if, and people will often say what you know if you were left on an island what one book would you uh what book of the what chapters of the bible would you uh choose and i would probably either choose john the Gospel of John or Romans. Um, as a believer, mm-hmm. uh, as an established believer, I like Romans best, frankly, because it's it's so scientific. It talks about the spiritual anatomy, um, the st- spiritual circumcision that took place. Yes. It's wonderful. Yes. Yes. Notice what it doesn't go into exhaustively. It doesn't go into Absolutely. the notion of gift, gift um, faith so, or, 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 uh, or understand. Like, like that's one thing I did want to touch on before we were over with today is that I wanted to talk about how they don't, like, 
people will add these things to the gospel and and think nothing of the fact that okay so you guys have to have to go through the fine tooth comb and find the tiniest little things that out of context might support this thing you're adding to the gospel um but you and you think that god would have would have just like that he, he wouldn't have gone into it exhaustively to make it clear if, if it's so crucial that's what's ridiculous to me is that that w w you know if you're having to 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 use the like the finest mesh strainer through every every uh, verse in scripture to find something that supports whatever you're adding to the cross um it, and but yet you think it's actually it's absolutely salvific in nature how how, how would well, you think god would would just you know overlook that and not repeat it over and over again or or make it abundantly clear instead of having these like oh like little verses like this like from faith to faith i mean that's not clear you know even if you said that it supports this idea of gift faith which it doesn't but even if even it, like even if it did that would have been a very uh sloppy way for god to 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 hammer home something that you think is so crucial to people's understanding exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, you know, just one of the things we're talking about, what it does say, what the Bible does say, you know, but we also need to look at like what it doesn't say. You know, we're talking about Romans being the most complete, you know, it's like an opus, a magnum opus of, of the gospel that Paul, that Paul, you know, uh, uh, really, uh, well, God through Paul blessed us with. Um, and yet we don't see any uh, 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 time spent on understanding this notion, on, you know, understanding this notion of gift, faith and seeking and all this stuff that uh that we're now being called false teachers for not preaching it's just ridiculous like if it were if it were something you know either true or you know uh, especially if it were <laughs> extremely crucial god would have uh uh you know repeated himself over and over again he would have um you know had multiple backups for it all over scripture so that we would understand we yes. would have had lots and lots of parables that would depict you know mm -hmm. this principle in one way or another we don't see that yeah. We have these little verses yeah. taken out of context, like with every other false teaching. Right. Yeah, e exactly, exactly. And, and also another thing to think about with that, with understanding when that was written, this was written to a pagan nation or to, to two believers in a pagan nation. Yep. Um, and the fact that, that so these people would not have had readily available, easy access to the Old Testament scriptures. And furthermore, they don't have the benefit. So basically, if, if all you had was Romans, which was basically what it was, Paul is trying to yeah. address. That, that's that's the, that's one thing with Romans that's unique is it is to the church in Romans, but it's yet also written in general to the Roman people, but it is written to the saints in Romans, but it's it's more a broad audience. And you know this from some of the phrases he uses. Um, uh for example, uh, let, let me let me see. Light, knowledge, knowledge. So the Jews thought of light as the ultimate thing. The Greeks thought of knowledge as the ultimate thing. Um, Romans specifically thought of glory. As the ultimate thing, that's why you have the 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 Colosseum, the the, the Colosseum fights in Rome. Okay? Right and science that was glory, right? So Second Corinthians four six, God who hath commanded the light to shine out of the darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You understand? Light, knowledge, wow. glory. Wow. Yep. I he addresses the three main groups of people living at that time in one verse. But that was written to the Corinthian church. The second epistle. The second letter to them. But so 
again, the the whole thing with Romans, it's written to the saints in Romans, but it is a, a the only one that is directly written to what is also a nation. You, you understand? Because Paul was a citizen of yes. Rome. Yes. So that's yes. important. And so <laughs> if he writes that, so let's just, ex- it, 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 let's just envision for a second you are a citizen of Rome. You get and you're and you're a believer, and you get this letter, and it it comes to your church. Let's say your your group of of believers, and you guys copy it and you pass it around to people, and then you go out after reading this and 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 already having spent some time hearing Paul preach. And so you understand these things and you, and you try to learn it and best. And then you go out into your nation to proclaim what you have been taught in this letter. If that's not enough for you to proclaim to other people to get saved. God's derelict in the community. Exactly. Exactly. Which is why Jesus said in that passage in John that all of Scripture is written about me, Jesus, to point you to me. That that is the key point. So that includes the Old Testament when Jesus spoke and the New Testament, which was written to look back at Christ and, and uh, as a key to unlock the Old Testament further, to reveal the mystery of Christ that's already written in the Old Testament. <clears throat> that's what was given to Paul, was the dispensation of the mystery of Christ, which is what... Jesus said was already written in the Old Testament, but hidden. Absolutely. That's, uh, so that's one of the things that's so important to understand is God's not going, God's a perfectionist. He, he made this so clear with with the Old Testament. And, you know, if, you know, when he's laying out every little tiny, like, jaunt and tittle of the law, we see that he doesn't leave any of his bases uncovered. He, he makes sure... Uh, he, the repetition, he uses repetition over and over again to hammer it home because he knows how the human mind works. And if you can't find um, a concept re- like repeated over and over in scripture, it's probably either not true or it's not salvific. Because he's very, very thorough. And um, that that's why. Uh, Indeed. Uh, uh, Okay. Indeed. Yeah. But we yeah. are coming up on 11 p.m. And we have Ooh. yet to discuss, uh, to even address Ephesians 1.13, which is fine. God has led us in the direction he wanted us to go. But let's just real quick, uh, uh, let's look at Ephesians 1.13. In whom ye also trusted, which is, of course, talking about Christ. Uh, verse 12. To, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. So that's the first thing, trust in Christ. So in whom he also trusted after that he heard the word of the truth. So when does trust take place? Uh, the, uh, in the word of after. truth is the gospel of your salvation, right? Yep. So does trust happen... Before you hear the gospel, or after you hear the gospel, after it's not after. hard to tr- it's not hard to trust a perfectly righteous God. Uh, right, you right. Need to get to and know Him. Oh, yeah, yeah. After yes, after you hear it. Not okay. I was, I was getting confused. After you believe it. No. After yeah yeah. After you hear it. Right, right. Do you trust mm-hmm. it after you believe it? Either. Or is uh, when it says, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, is it saying you believed after you trusted? Or is it is it uh, right. another way of saying that trust and belief are synonymous? 
Yes, uh, that yes, and that's one of the things about seeking that's always bothered me is that if you trust God enough to to seek Him in terms of uh, in terms of uh, you know basically I, I don't know this weird this weird uh, liminal state where you uh, you believe the facts of the gospel but you're having to and you're having to trust God to I don't know give you this special understanding where where even though you already believe that it's you know eternal and it's by faith alone you're still not actually saved because you still, you know, haven't trusted him enough yet. You're trusting him enough to seek him for this understanding. Like that, that doesn't, you know, make sense to me at least, because I know for me, it was kind of either, or, you know, mm-hmm. upon trusting him enough to understand, you know, uh, to un- like the, the understanding and the, 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 the receiving of the gospel was like simultaneous to the trust. There, you know, like I could, I can't really separate them out because I'm hearing the gospel because I trust this God and the character of a God that was presenting such a gospel. I am believing it, if that makes sense. Um, not, but, but to trust Him enough and even understand the gospel is not of works, and and to to still have to, you know, to trust Him enough to keep seeking until this this additional understanding. That's that's not you know that that that's actually more than facts. Um, you understand the facts, but you have to get some other type of understanding that it relies on trusting God enough to keep. See, this is all ridiculous. It doesn't actually make sense if you really think about how trust works. And okay, sorry, my my earbud died. Give me a second. You guys go on. I'm trying to have to. Good. You sound good. Yeah. <clears throat> right, I'm, I'm I'm on speaker real quick. Let's see. Okay. Just a second. I'm gonna. I'm going to have to reconnect, but you guys can go on. Okay. So in other words, I just, you know, looking at the, at the Greek of this again, if if we were to simplify this down in whom Christ, in whom after hearing the gospel of your salvation, the truth, he believed and we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. So there's hearing the gospel. That's the truth, which is the truth of the truth, Christ. So hear or read perhaps, but hear, trust slash believe sealed. Not sealed to cause trust not sealed to cause belief sealing by the holy spirit happens after ye believe after ye trust so there is no deposit of god until ye believe Not prior, not at the same time. After. That should clear up this whole gift faith idea. Because there is no seal of the Holy Spirit. There is no regeneration prior to belief or at the same time as belief. Belief happens after the gospel is proclaimed in some manner, primarily through preaching. Follows after that belief, follows after that, immediately after you are sealed. So just wanted to re-clarify that. We did go over that a little bit last week. That's why it was kind of okay that we went off on a lot of great tangents. Um, So, uh, but I do want to wrap up since it is now 11 Um, o'clock. Normally we would do a song and uh, play a song and then close in prayer uh, after we just sum up our thoughts uh, and give the gospel, but we have proclaimed the gospel throughout the entire night. Um, I will read, uh, or if one of you two wants to read first Corinthians 15, one through four, and then, 
uh, give your closing thoughts and then pass it to the other and then we can end close in prayer. Um, I, I can read it. I'm going to have to pull it up. Okay. Four, sorry, I'm on my phone. That's um, all right. But yeah, uh, man, I can't believe it's already so late. We're going to KJV. I just prefer KJV. I'm not a KJV romance, but I have always loved it before I was a believer. All right, so, um, wait. Never mind. All right, you want to do it because now it's, oh, wait, no, here we go. Here we go. This should work. One, first Corinthians one through four. Okay. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and 15, one through four, 15, one through four. Okay. Sorry. Yes, yeah. Yes. All right. So, sorry. Okay. You, you want to go ahead and do it? Cause I'll, uh, you probably have it up already and I don't want to make us wait anymore. I will. Um, that's, okay. that's okay. Okay. Uh, unless Ben, you want to do it. I could do it. Um, okay. I had I had the new King James. Is that going to be too much? No, no, I'm okay. not a King James onlyist. Okay. Well, uh, First Corinthians, uh, fifteen, verse one through four. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you until, excuse me. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast to the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Amen. Amen. That, doesn't, Amen. that doesn't deviate badly from the King James. No, it doesn't. And, and even with that, you know, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're reading from King James, New King James, NIV, as long as you understand context and keeping to the promises of God of salvation being eternal, you will never misinterpret scripture. Right. Okay. That's important because uh, King James says, if you keep in memory, uh, uh, the new King James says, if he holds fast, well, if you understand what hold fast actually is meaning, it doesn't mean, uh, if you hold on to, it literally means to, it means to hold on mentally, but hold fast to keep is, is how you stand. Um, and that's why Paul writes it that way. He writes, uh, I preach unto the gospel also, which is, what you've already received, so if you received it, you've believed it, and are saved. So receive, stand, saved. Uh, re received, stand, saved, memory. So received goes with saved, stand goes with memory. Follow? That, that's how Paul is writing that. He's not saying you're saved only if you keep this in memory. No, he's saying you're saved because you received it. You stand by keeping it in memory. That's the helmet of salvation in Ephesians chapter 6, is keeping in memory so you can stand, 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 stand. That's another way of of studying scripture in context is looking for key words. Who are they addressed to and doing what? Believers stand by putting on the, the, the helmet of salvation. They stand by putting on the, the weapons of our warfare for they are not carnal. They are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. Okay. So, all of those things that Paul wrote to Ephesus, to the saints in Ephesus, were for believers to do in order to what? To stand so they don't fall, not out of grace, not out of salvation, but stand in their warfare, not falling back and neglecting our duties of the body of Christ. 
into the body of Christ. So that helmet of salvation, by keeping it in memory, is the is is what you're doing there with that with the gospel by keeping it in memory. And that's why Peter says uh, that that to to those that he says something to the effect of uh, talking about people who have uh, been shipwrecked in their faith, something to that effect. He says. Uh, for they have forgotten their sins were purged. And uh, he he calls them blind, but not totally. He says they're blind, for they cannot see afar off. So they can only see a little bit in front of them. They still have some light. So they're only partially blind. They're not totally blind, because if they were totally blind, they wouldn't be saved. They have no light. Okay? So... That's how you stand is by keeping in memory the gospel that you believed, received, and were saved thereby. You keep that in memory, you will be able to stand against the enemy and his uh, devices and his deceptions against the gospel and against God. You'll be able to stand against those things. So, okay. And to Uh, believe in vain is to believe uh, short of the resurrection. Yes, to, is to believe Christ is not risen. Yep. Uh, and, and therefore, if Christ is not risen, then we won't be risen. Your faith is in vain. You're yet in your sins. Um, all that. Yes, that's what believing in vain is. That's not uh, calling, you know, you need to have some special faith or some gift faith or anything like that. The only thing that is believing in vain is not believing that Christ is risen from the dead, which proclaims that Christ is God. Okay. <clears throat> and that and we're still dead. That, death. Yes. yes and we're, we're, yeah. we're not dead in our sins. Right. We're not dead in our sins. We're forgiven. All of that is is implied as part of that, but that's the... That's how you believe in vain if you don't believe Christ is risen. Correct. Yep. Because then you have no promise of a resurrection yourself. Right. Okay. So, uh, anyway, so final thoughts? Uh, Go. uh, (laughs) I'll go first, I guess. I'm usually pretty brief. Um, But I, I thought it was a really great discussion again today. Uh, we did did have some technical difficulty with the music. The streaming software is extremely buggy. Uh, I need to figure out why that's occurring suddenly. It was working fine for days and days and days. I'm not sure what's going on, but I do apologize about that. But we'll make sure that we're uh, well prepared for next time um, and that we're locked and loaded ahead of time. And uh, But either way, the discussion is what I think we're all here for. And um, I thought it was a really great discussion and very edifying and learned some new things, which are, is makes the the price of admission uh all the more worthwhile (laughs) all right and i'll just say i feel very blessed to be part of the panel and um i also just think it was wonderful how god uh, delivered us through that uh, bit of roboting because i was real worried there for a second i didn't know what we were going to do if that wouldn't uh that problem didn't get taken care of and uh uh praise Mm. god uh, my my kind of uh, airheaded suggestion about airplane mode actually did the trick so but it was probably the the prayer that uh, that really came through for us because i'm not sure i've ever seen that work but uh <laughs> i was just kind of, that's kind of how i try to fix everything i just turn on airplane mode and for me normally that doesn't work or help me at all but uh but it's Praise like God. a last ditch for the technically impaired so um anyway i uh, just uh love you guys and um uh today's wednesday so i guess it'll be no today's thursday all right so right so i will be on tomorrow night uh with the the fun friday fellowship and i'll see you guys then. amen amen uh so yeah um uh just my my final thought uh would be uh number one believe the gospel if you haven't and be saved so you can have eternal life and you don't have to worry about hell and then live for Jesus uh and uh and and proclaim the gospel to others um as you learn it uh proclaim it in a more deeper way and uh but keep it simple make sure that you keep the gospel 
in its simplicity as you explain it in more depth. Um, thirdly, that, um, that I believe God preserves his word and that no matter what version you are using, as long as you are not taking scripture out of its context and you are not, um, going against e the eternal security that we have in Christ, you will preach and proclaim the truth. Um, and no matter what version you're using, including the King James, if you don't do that and you take scriptures out of their context and you don't keep them in, uh, in, in alignment with the eternal security of the believer, you will mess it up. People do it all the time with King James. They do it with NIV. They do it with the new King James. They do it with the ESV. They, they'll take any version and take scripture out of its context. And the most important context is that eternal life is eternal for the believer, period. Once you believed, you receive eternal life. And that's in every version. So, um, that I have come across at least. So, uh, I like comparing several versions myself. I think it helps you study and learn more, uh, because personally, uh, I can't read Greek or Hebrew. And although I do like to look at, uh, you know, the interlinear and see what, uh, a direct translation of the words are that helps too, but uh, you get kind of the same thing from reading several versions in the same language of the same verses. So that does give you a more, I think, more complete understanding of what the Greek or Hebrew was trying to say. As long as you keep it in context and keep it to nothing can come against the truth that God has spoken about our eternal life. So um, I'm going to close in prayer. Um, I haven't seen any uh, prayer requests in the chat. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean they weren't there. Um, but uh, if either of you guys want to pray, uh, go ahead now, or I will start in praying in five seconds to close. That's all you, man. Okay. Dear Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this time together. Uh, thank you for delivering us uh, from the technical uh, difficulties we had in the middle. I pray that you would help us uh, and help Ben be able to figure out uh, why the, the music wasn't able to play and help us have that um, ready and for next time uh and i just pray and thank you for 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 everything that was proclaimed tonight and i i pray your blessing over it and again that it would that and believe that it was not our words that were spoken but yours and that you have guided us as to what we were to to speak and I pray again that these things would would be and have been spirit and life to those listening. And if anyone who does not believe would come to know you as as their Savior and as their as their Lord, that you are Lord no matter what. And uh, I just pray that that they would uh, be able to hear and believe and be set free from the law of sin and death and be liberated into the law of faith. Um, and I thank you for all these things that you do, have done, and continue to do in our lives. And I pray also that tonight and uh, every message and time spent on this channel uh, would be edifying to also to the believers uh, that, that would cause us all to grow more in our walk with God with you, with Jesus, and to become more like you in this earth and be able to more accurately uh, proclaim the truth in love, always in love, and give us wisdom, give us patience, but most of all, 
let your love shine in our hearts and shine through us into the world, that we be a light not hidden in this world, that a light that will shine the brightness of Christ and that people will see that in us as we grow to be more like you, yet we already are exactly like you, covered under your blood. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, y'all. Good night Amen. in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.